Welcome. Today is, gosh, I can't believe we're already almost like toward the end of August. Today is Tuesday, August the 23rd, 2022. This is a Board of County Commissioners work session meeting, and we are delighted today to have a very special room full of guests and also to have all five members of the board at the table. We're starting our meeting off with our, it's generally annual. I'm not sure if we did it all through COVID. I know we did some we always were in touch, but maybe not this close in touch. So today is our um, our annual meeting with CEDA. So Brian, if you'd like to introduce what we have here today. Great. Well, yes. And it, again, this is a, normally an annual event where uh, CDOT comes in and engages elected officials about the issues uh, that they're dealing with and also the issues that we are, we're dealing with. Um, I'm Brian Pettit. I'm the Public Works Director for the county and work uh, alongside CDOT with, on transportation issues. And uh, I do want to say that CDOT is a, is a great partner when it comes to solving problems, and they are met with some of the same challenges we are at the county when it comes to uh, finding qualified employees right now. But uh, I won't take any time for me. We've got an hour and a half today, so we want to take our time to work through what other issues are at hand. And I'll kick it off to uh, my right, and uh, please introduce yourself, and we'll go from there. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Jason Smith. I, I'm the new RTD for Region 3 of Grand Junction. I replaced Mike Goolsby. He retired recently. Um, so, yeah, we brought a staff here with us to hopefully answer all your questions today. Uh, it is great to be back in person to meet with you. Uh, so we're kicking them off. You're the first meeting we have um, of the year out of 15 counties. Uh, so we're excited to kind of get going and, and get back into communication on a regular basis with the counties in person. So probably a lot to talk about because it has been a few years since we've met. So we appreciate you taking the time and really going through this. Uh, hopefully everybody has the copy of the book. Um, we'll we'll kind of go through it, but we're just going to hit it on a high note because we want to leave plenty of time for comments and discussion 
for you know anybody that uh, has concerns. So to start off with, I'd like our staff to kind of introduce themselves. So as they come up, you kind of know who they are and what their roles are. So we can start here with our commissioner. Yep, I, I know some of you, Kathy Hall. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. Kathy. Hi. Welcome Hi. back. I'm the commissioner <laughs> for Region Seven, which is which is Pitkin County, and it is. It's nice to be back in, in person. It's been three years since we were able to come up here in person. So glad to be here. Mark Rogers. Mark Rogers, Region 3 Regional Planning Manager. Good afternoon, Dave Cesark. I'm the Region Planning and Environmental Manager. Uh, Roland Wagner, I'm the Central Program Engineer, Region 3. TJ Blight, Deputy Maintenance Superintendent of Grand Junction. Don Poole, uh, Maintenance Storm in Glenwood Springs. Uh, Mark Bunnell, uh, Traffic and Safety Engineer out of Grand Junction. And Andrew Knapp, the uh, resident engineer out of Columbus Springs. Uh, again, so we'll just walk through the book here real quick. Um, yeah, the, the team of experts here, you've, you've maybe worked with some of them on occasions, uh, different things. They all have their area of expertise. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think we are faced with many of the challenges you're faced with right now, so you'll recognize a lot of what we're going through. But at a high level, if you just open up the book and, and start through it, um, you know, Region 3, it's a, it's a big region. 15 counties, uh, we have a lot of assets. As you kind of walk through there and see on the next page, um, a lot of infrastructure to maintain uh, and keep going. It's uh, definitely a challenge right now uh, with funding. Uh, as everybody knows, prices, we'll get into that a little bit more. You guys have the hardest part of the state. We think it is. I don't know. <laughs> it's the best it's part. Though. It's, it's the best Region part. Region 1 Denver <laughs> argues with us all the time. They think they definitely have their challenges. Yeah. With 13 the, mountain passes, though. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is pretty region. amazing what all we, our, our staff uh, you know, maintain. And so you see there uh, 580 full-time employees. Uh, well, I'd like to say that's uh, current and true. Uh, I will say 580 positions, but mm -hmm. I can't say I've got that many employees currently. Mm -hmm. um, really where we stand, uh, it's kind of jumping ahead here a page. Uh, we have about 120 vacancies in our region right now between maintenance and engineering. The majority of them being in section two maintenance. Uh, and, and most of those are our TM1 um, positions that are entry level that are snow plow operators, you know, and, and maintainers. And that's where we're really struggling right now as everybody probably knows. Uh, you know, just the starting salaries, getting staff brought in. It's very competitive out there, and, and we're losing a lot of good people because of the competition, and it's hard to recruit. Just yes. a question, Section 2 versus, you're not talking Region 2, you're talking Section 2 in your region. Yeah, so what we have section? section 6 and Section 2, and as we go here, there's another map okay, with uh, maintenance sections, and we do have two maintenance sections, uh, kind of a north-south division. Um, Section 2 is kind of I-70 down to the south. Section 2 of Region 3. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, where's that map? It is confusing, it right? Yeah, we're already <laughs> so, lost. <laughs> apologize. And we'll get to the map. It'll make more sense. So you see our regional leadership team over here. Uh, these are the contacts, kind of, uh, and it, it goes more into detail later on. But, but this is the leadership team, everybody that's uh, kind of the, the managers in the region, if you need any you know, assistance on something, you kind of see their areas of expertise of where they're located. Um, you can click on those if you have the uh, links and it should bring up our contact information. If not, you can always get a hold of myself or, or one of the, the representatives that you know and we can get you the contact that you need. I'm sorry, there is a map on page 31. If you want to just look at that real quick, it breaks down the, the maintenance sections in the state. Um, just oh, just yeah. so you're aware. You can see some regions just have one section per region. Uh, we have two since we're such a large region. We're divided up. So on page six, you'll see, uh, kind of start getting into some of our challenges here. Um, and this goes into the details of the employee gap, uh, the vacancies that we have. It's a map of the entire state, but you can see in the red, that's really the critical areas that, that we're getting above that 20% vacancy. Um, down below there, you see those uh, round circles with some numbers in them. Those are the sections. Back to section two is Grand Junction. In this area, you know, 36% vacancies. It's very high, and that changes constantly. Um, you know, these numbers were pulled a, a few weeks ago, so they're 
probably a little different right now. And then at the very bottom, you can see that graph that kind of shows you from Walcott up to the uh, tunnels on the vacancy rate. And, and we're really struggling along the main corridor there by 70, uh, just the challenges. And the biggest reason is the cost of living. Um, we're having a hard time with the cost of living along with just uh, the availability of housing. We get that. And, and so, yeah, it's one thing if you can afford it, but is it even available? And, and so we're doing many things right now, and, and TJ can answer questions as we go. Um, he's been challenged with this in his team of trying to you know, figure out ways we can do things. Uh, we've got a lot of different groups working on stuff. Uh, we'll probably get into a little bit of discussion here about some housing. Okay, yes, sir. A uh, question about housing. Uh, down at Willits, you used to have, I think it was a little trailer park there, mm -hmm. but now it's mostly just the maintenance building, I believe. But could that property be turned into uh, a housing for CDOT employees again? It's a great lead in. So <laughs> we actually had a meeting yesterday with uh, Eagle County and Pitkin County representatives about discussing building some employee housing in there, how we can team up with the counties. Um, to, to figure out what we can do, uh, whether it's cost sharing, what we need to be able to build some units in there. We don't know exactly what type of housing yet, whether it's 20 units. Um, currently there's four, I think four lots in there for at modular kind of housing parking. I think only two of them are used with state patrol right now. We have right? four, four currently in there with oh, state patrol. patrol. They're all state patrol? All state patrol in there. Because we have nobody on that patrol for up here. We're actually at zero. So. And so that Six gets into patrolling. this area in particular. <laughs> so, yes, as TJ said, zero employees up here. We have lost our entire staff on an 82 court. Our last two, the city of Aspen took from us. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently the city of Aspen pays a little more than we do, and it's appealing to them, and we're struggling. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Kelly. Do you want to give a profile of the type of um, candidate you would be looking for for anyone who's listening or anyone we know to send you away? TJ? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and we go for honor. Kind of, yeah, come, yeah. On come on up, take a seat there. I was hoping, yeah. to, I was hoping to stay in the back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that mic right there, just turn the red light on. Is your to go? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, for our candidates, we're looking for a basic TM1 is um, any of you have two years of construction experience. Uh, hopefully, right now it's currently at the CDL, a Class B or higher, air brakes, air tankers. So two years of heavy equipment, heavy construction, and a CDL. Um, we're to the point we've actually started announcing our all of ours without CDLs, and then we have our own in-house trainers and testers. So we're we're working on that program, we're training them as well. But the bad thing, like up here, we have nobody left to train anybody if we hire them. Um, Mm -hmm. Don and Glenwood just hired two last week with non-CDL, so mm -hmm. we're going to bring them in, try to get them trained up, and then go from there. So that's the, that's kind of the level we're looking at is just a basic couple of years of construction and a, hopefully a CDL, but at this point we'll take a non-CDL and try to train them to get them up to the point. So And obviously a clean record, high school diploma. Yeah, of. clean record. I mean, a fairly clean record. It doesn't have to be a spotless <laughs> for sure, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know what our background, you know, consist of we do have some standards with our HR to get past that part of it but I mean you have to have a CDL and current valid driver's license and live within we do have a 60 mile 60 minute up here and we've actually moved it down now to anybody we can live as far down as rifle okay. to commute up to the valley. Francie, mm -hmm. Francie and then Greg. Thank you. I'm sure you guys know RAFT is having exactly the same situation mm -hmm. and like trying to figure out housing so that they can get some drivers also and they yeah. also are doing their own cdl training and trying to do whatever they Would that can do cross over for you guys their cdl training or is it two different no it's the same it's it's, it's all same. federally based so um we have some of our trainers and our tester in montrose have actually tested some county employees so if you know if you guys are the point that you need a certified tester we have okay. one based out at montrose so it's a little further to drive okay. but they can test, he's, he's open to test anybody, any government agency, he will not test anybody outside of, you know, public, so. I think RAFT, Raft I think, is trying to do in-house training. They're doing their, yeah, they're yeah. doing their own now, so that yeah. they don't Maybe have to go to the Front Range or Montrose or whatever. And so ours, for the classroom, they would have to go to Mont to Denver for a week to yeah. do an in-house yeah. book training, and then the two weeks driving, we can do it here. We've got our some of our guys trained to be able to be certified training since the federal, of course, on top of this, the federal regulation 
difference. Mm -hmm. Just well, changed. So maybe it would be worth it just to talk to RAFTA and see if their training would be applicable to mm -hmm. you guys because you might get people who don't want to go to Denver for a week. Or yeah, and to get the basic training to get the CDL, it works great. And like I say, we're trying to do it in 90 days, but then we still can't just give somebody that's only been driving for 90 days a big plow truck and a wing and <laughs> send them down 82. So we <laughs> that. I mean, there's a there's a thing about yeah, having a license, but what what level do you get comfortable with? And yeah. each employee's different. You know, you have those that have a good background driving that pick it up fairly quick, and those that don't. So I think our next best, next step, like Jason's talking about, is housing. How do we how do we come up with affordable housing in this valley, the Vale Valley? And that's you know parting with. You guys were working with the town of Frisco, Summit County. I've had meetings with the town of Gypsum, Eagle County. Um, that was with Algebel coming into the place to be with you guys in Pitkin County and that for what that looks like for housing. And have you well, talked hopefully to the habitat? state voters will uh, pass the affordable housing. Yeah. Great. Yeah, just, um, you know, Habitat for Humanity in the Valley is really strong and they're doing a lot uh, and they're trying to do affordable you know, energy efficient housing, um, just that be somebody to have in your call list. Uh, Gail, you know, Gail Schwartz That's might be suggestion. able to work with you on, you know, say you do something down at this facility in Elgibel or in Willits, just thinking, you know, let's do something. Yeah, our ultimate goal would be to take half of that facility, I think it's about four acres, take about two acres, build affordable housing, uh, you know, like I said, more of a, a apartment kind of units down there, even up 15 to 20 units. and, and we would like to be able to fill, you know, good over half of them, but then there would be, you know, probably ten units left remaining. That's the that spot would across be. from the fire station. Yeah, yeah. right next nice to the place. river. And right next to the river. Location. It's a beautiful yeah. lot. And unfortunately, we just have no employees now to even use that barn. Um, so it's just sitting there for storage for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as soon as we get employees, we go right back to, back you know, to be people be there daily to work out of that patrol. And that barn is old. It's scheduled to get replaced. That's part of this discussion. Is do we replace that barn in that, you know, in that location? Do we look for some other property with the city, the county to move the barn? And then we have more acreage to put employee housing. So we're pretty open to about any suggestion right now and table to put it on the table of what looks, you know, what's a good partnering to get housing for everybody. Because we know everybody's in the same, the same boat we are is trying to get affordable housing for our employees to work up here. And unfortunately, Trailer parks are not appealing anymore for people to, to move into. And be careful. Have, I live in the trailer park. I, I have no problem with trailer <laughs> parks. But a lot of our people that Staff. we, especially the younger generation, we ask them, you know, show them our trailer parks. And I just, they're like, absolutely not. I live really? in right here. Yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, like we said, the ones we have right now are CSP. They are one trailer, and the other ones are actually in RVs. They're not even in a trailer house. so And they're just here for... Most of them are less than six months, seven months. They get their time in, and then they move on. That's why it's an RV, and it's fairly. You got to get those tiny homes built down there. Yeah, tiny homes. I mean, that's we've talked about tiny homes. So yeah. it's. I mean, we're. Yeah, we're what? looking at all options. CSBs actually went and uh, they were able to get some grants and buy RVs for some of their staff out on the East Slope. Cause they're having the same problems as we are. You know. Yeah. And we need to be putting a staff in every community. You know, that's really the way we're set up. We're essential employees, and, and we're there to, for emergency response as well. And so even knowing that, I'm looking at Brian Pettit behind you, knowing that our staff is stretched thin up here, um, it's my understanding that we may be in some talks to see how we can ensure we have snow plowing at some levels and how we might be able to work something out with CDOT. Yes. Um, we got to start sharing our resources, and <laughs> especially when they come to human resources. So. Yeah, we've done really well in the past, and I think we're just going to have to expand it even more. And we have a – our superintendent, John David, is actually working with Brian and everybody at the city to get a meeting together with our executive director and the director of maintenance to have that discussion on Great. Yeah, what that looks like. Any options right now. Well, we're, we're open. <laughs> we're, we got to be creative. Go ahead, Kelly. Thank you. Is um, the funding that would cover housing come out of a distinct fund from CDOT, or does that – move money into housing away from road projects and things yeah we have some money um actually we're looking at going and trying to you know, obtain some more funds mm -hmm. uh, with legislatures sure. uh, so we kind of have a plan but we do have you know some money set aside right now that we could use it's limited mm -hmm. so we've been talking to dola we're, and that's where we're looking for any partnerships we can get mm -hmm. and why we're trying to 
really maximize the use of our funds because mm -hmm. it's pretty limited on what we yeah. have available. But we feel right now that we're going to have to pull the funds that we need to get some of this started because mm -hmm. it is that long-term investment. That it's the only way for us to find a solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our building program is actually its own separate asset. So it's an asset okay. outside of road maintenance yeah. and engineering okay. projects and that. And it's just depending on the funding. And, of course, there's not enough right now in there. So it would be mm -hmm. general fund money or wherever to mm -hmm. where we can find to fund it because the actual property asset is not big enough to cover much. Okay. They, they build maybe one to two buildings a year statewide mm -hmm. out of that fund. So there's not a lot of. Yeah, we got to find a quicker yeah, Well, fix I guess I wonder if, um, you know, because the, the ARPA fund, housing funds that were set aside have dedicated 50% allocation to rural and rural resort. And I think there's some concern is whether we'll be able to draw down on that before it would then go back to urban parts of the state. So maybe this is an opportunity to help pull some of that down for that equitable balance in the spending of funding. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I was going to say if we can advocate. You know, if you need help writing letters and all that, you know, letter writing chain might be helpful. No, I think that the, the more we can get, the stronger we'll be. Uh, so, so that partnership and support is huge. And then if we can show it's mixed use, right? I mean, that's where it's mm -hmm. like it's not just our department, but there's other other you know, county employees mm -hmm. or RAFTA, whoever it may be. If we could you know team up that way, I think it makes it stronger. Who, right. Who's your outreach? Who would be writing the? Putting that together, or is that you? Is that are you be the the lead on? Well, the team will be part of it, but uh, the director of maintenance right now is leading the effort. Uh, John Lormay is his name, um, and, and he's kind of taking this as his highest initiative at the moment because we have so many vacancies. Um, we have other things going on besides housing, trying to figure out how to, you know, make our TM1 positions more appealing. You know, we're working on, you know, things like you know just the the base pay, bonus programs, you know. You know, talking about CDL, we take 100% of that cost. We even pay for all that training. So we're not requiring them to go pay for it. It's, it's we hire and, and we're willing to get them, you know, the trained up and, and pay for all of the expenses. Too. How, how many leave after six months? Well, uh, I don't know um, if we have any numbers. We, we started with a trainee program, so we've done a lot with younger kids, 18, 19 years right out of high school, and we're about 60%, I would say, that stay. Okay, great. So we're, we're not bad. I mean, I'll say stay for a couple of years. We've had some, right. you know, we get a right. year or two into them, and then they go on. But if we, if we keep them for about a year after they get their CDL, I, I consider that a success. And, I mean, a lot of them are leaving. We've had one guy from Glenwood left for RAFTA, for higher paying, got his CDL, and went to RAFTA. I mean, that's part of the deal, and it's just like our guys from up here that went to the city of Aspen with their CDL. They, we shuffle around just because of who, pay, who pays the best and who has the best benefits. So. At least they're kind of on the same road. Yeah, they're <laughs> in the same general area. So <laughs> so John Lormay is actually hiring a, um, I don't even know what he's going to call it, but a projects, a special projects director mm -hmm. that's going to start taking this. I don't think he's got that person hired yet, but once they're on board, that would be the lead. But, yeah, for right now, Jason or I, yeah, so any ideas to us, and then we can. Yeah, Phyllis, I'm going to look to you. Maybe this is something we need to – we have a – a housing initiative that we're working on so maybe this is a good contact for Ashley so we can bring um, CEDA into the loop uh, that we're doing this about this valley-wide effort and we need to get wrapped up we need to get CEDA at the table I think these guys fall into the essential workforce category yeah yeah <laughs> so Steve please so worst case scenario going into the winter if you are 36 percent short on staffing uh, what's the scenario on highway 82 for snow plowing and cleaning up the rock ball at shale bluffs so great and Jay doesn't get flat ride tires his some of you drove highway. by me today on my way into town i saw a sea dot go by as i was on my e-bike <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were talking about that this morning we got a question for brian later about that so um yeah i mean like last winter we were we only had two last winter so we were really short last winter and we so were able still plowed drivers for highway 82? yeah i was always on the corridor last winter that I actually reported that. to Elgibel. we we took the patrol out of glenwood that came to carbondale and we moved them up a whole patrol and then we moved everybody up the corridor to cover that and then the guys out of grand junction we Basically used a lot of our shop mechanics, um, anybody who has a CDL or special trades and that, and they came out on a rotational basis to cover roads down there while we pushed everybody up. And that's that's the same it's going to be this winter. That, and we'll probably have to do some type of model like we do in the Vail Valley. We, we rent a motel room for 
10 or 12 of them and they come up on a rotation and plow snow and then go back home. And that could be statewide. That's what we've had to do along the I-70 corridor as they come from any corner of the state. And right now, just so you guys know, on the weekends too, we have a group coming from Greeley, Pueblo. They come up every weekend to spell Don's crew for the watches and warnings for the Glenwood Canyon. And then when the weather's good, they go out and help fix guardrail fences and all that. So we're already doing that, putting them up on the weekends, just trying to get one Don's crew to have a, have a weekend off. He had guys that have been 35, 40 days without a day off. Oh, jeez. Mm. So really giving them a day off and then plus having some extra manpower to help get oh, caught up on just some of the maintenance. So it's not volunteer to come up. It's like you're going. Well, no, they're volunteers because they get paid. <laughs> they get overtime for coming up and then the per diem and that. So right now statewide. They're, those guys are volunteering, but last winter, yes, we had a lot of, you're not oh. volunteering, you're, here's a plow truck, go to Aspen. <laughs> when you Thank get you to Aspen, come back. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we're tried, we try never to go to the voluntold, but at sometimes we do. We always try to try to do volunteer because you always get better work. If they're, if they're wanting to be there, they're easier on our equipment, they do a better job and that. So, And right now we're having great, great success with outside of our region other parts of the state come in to help us. So so we'll, we'll, we'll take all the help it. we can get. But we are nervous for winter. It depends what type yeah. of winter we get and how hard and fast and with the limited staff we have. So We're I mean, trying to keep our streets clean up here, so yeah. that rain. We have challenges ahead. We're, we're trying hard to recruit and hire as fast as we can. We've, we've actually expedited our hiring process now uh, for TM1 your, so we can get them on board. Yes, sorry, what's your starting salary for the folks you're trying to recruit up here? I knew somebody was going to ask. I can't remember. <laughs> you can give a range just just to pique people's interest. Um, It's 30, 38.80, isn't it, Colin? Starting salary for TM1? 38.80. 38.80 and then 500 housing on top of it. Okay. 38.80 what? <laughs> $38,000 a year, $38 That's a year. That's a 38.80, $3,880 a month. Okay. 500 housing allowance, but on then top after that, a year, there's a 10% 10 training increase. pay on top of that after a year. And then a few specialty programs, there's a snow bonus that we did last year, which was 2000 if they made every snowstorm and actually came out and plowed, looking at increasing that, you know, so that's, so we're at on the low end and that's, that's the bad thing with ours. It's based statewide. Sure. Yeah. The same position that's here, that is in Grand Junction, that's in yeah. Durango, yeah. that's in you know, Lamar, Colorado. So mm -hmm. let's they all pay the same. No, um, they all start customer. the same, yeah, right now. Yeah. And then, then the housing's on top of that, and that's where the division right now. Mm -hmm. We used to have extreme hard to fill, and some of that went away. Four or five years ago when everything was good, we were getting people, we pushed everybody back, brought it up. Well, now we're back to needing to come back to some type of extreme hard to fill, extreme housing, whatever it is for our mountain communities that we just can't get people. <clears throat> And it's not necessary. I mean, we have the same problem in Lake City, Gateway, smaller towns that there's, like Lake City, it's everything up there to rent is an Airbnb. There's nothing for a long-term rental. There's nothing available in a lot of these communities. We're working on that too. Yeah. <laughs> and so you have a 20% benefits package or something on top of that? Or? Yeah. Our benefits, you know, there's what, 12, I think we're up to 12 holidays Hol a day. And mm. basically for a maintenance worker, we buy uniforms, boots, eyewear, hats, Jackets, gloves, I mean, pretty much everything except socks and underwear are available. <laughs> That'll be next. Wow. For them. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we're, that's what it takes to get somebody in, I guess. <laughs> I consider. So, I mean, we, we have a pretty good benefits on top of it, just with their PPE and our holidays and retirement and all the stuff that goes with it. It's, that's some of our challenge because a lot of, you know, the recruitment, a lot of the employees looking out there, they're, they're looking for just base pay. Mm -hmm. and that's where we're struggling right now. A lot of people are not looking long-term and benefit yeah. packages mm -hmm. and total compensation. They're just looking at purely what's the bottom line dollars are getting paid. Yeah, what's an hour do I get? We're struggling with that to be competitive right now, honestly. Yeah. How many female drivers do you have? Oh, geez, we've probably got, um, I'd say we're up to just the entry level. We've probably got six or seven and then scattered out through all our supervisor ranks. We have, Yeah. you know, Probably another six, seven, eight, just depending on it. So, but six or seven drivers. Yeah, and that's um, of course we have nobody up here, but <laughs> up the Vale Valley, we've had a fairly good success rate bringing in female drivers and 
long term keeping them and got we had a couple that we brought in but got a CDL and that and branching out that way it's mm -hmm. it's just a tough job that you're you know, on call 24 7 you miss holidays Christmases birthday parties and yeah yeah that's 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 another bad thing we have with our employees we bring them in the benefit package and then you say you know well you're on call 24 7 well what's that mean you know, we can relate you, know, you, may, to that. you may be working Christmas you may be <laughs> That's that's a tough sell. Yeah. Especially when you're already five to ten bucks an hour less than, you know, Walmart or somebody else. So. Hmm. Yeah. But these trucks are different than we have now too. The drive, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, TJ can go into the details because I, I don't have a CDL and drive, but but they're definitely more electronic. They're automatics, you know, so that it, it's it's a different driving, I guess, experience than what it used to be. Of, of you know, you really had to understand how to drive a truck and shift. The manuals, uh, these are a little different to operate. Uh, and you're definitely using, you know, well, everything around to, to be aware with the, the We're plows. working on videos and that to show the inside of the trucks and show to try to get the younger crowd interested in how, how much it is electronic inside of it, man. It's pretty cool, actually. That, I've been, you know, yeah. working 26 years with maintenance, and I these new trucks I can't even get in and get started. So <laughs> when I started, they want me to drive, they need to get something about 20 years old and I can figure it out, but the new ones are. When I started driving school bus, I was driving a split axle shift. Yep. <laughs> and now it's like, you know, a totally different world for the technology. Yeah, it's it's amazing what's in there. So that's, I mean, we're trying that even to reach out to the, the technology side of it to bring people in. Try driving a snow cat on Aspen Mountain. Mm -hmm. Like being in a rocket ship. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's everything, is, which is great, but then also they break down more. So yeah. more mm -hmm. electronics, more stuff to go bad, and more money. So. They're yeah. tracking a lot, too. They track all the product they're putting down, location. That's you know, awesome. There's mm -hmm. a lot of information that's going into these you know, trucks and the drivers and what we're doing and, and being able to, to get better data for future storms along with right then if, if we're, what the road conditions are currently. Right? They're picking up that in, in real time. Yeah, so. tractors are like that now, too. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. it's GPS and we'll tell you, yeah, it's we're getting we're someday to be self-driving probably, but <laughs> not for a while. Time we need years. that quicker <laughs> as we can get it apparently. <laughs> Give them an hour and a half. So, okay, next. So keep on moving. Okay. Um, thanks, TJ. Yep. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So just as you move kind of through the book on page seven, uh, this is just you know some graphs, kind of illustrating the inflation we're seeing, as you know. Extreme inflation when it comes to construction right now. If you're bidding projects, you, you probably had that sticker shock yeah. of opening bids and seeing where it's at currently. And uh, we're just going into our uh, bidding season and starting to open some of our big bid packages and projects. And yeah, we're kind of going through that adjustment of what do we have to do to move funds around to get projects awarded because they're coming in, you know, anywhere from 15, 20, 25 percent higher on occasion. Um, different products it's not across the board equal you know everything's inflated it's it's certain products uh, we're seeing asphalt 100 percent inflation in the binder so, so there's certain things that are out there that are very challenging to get so uh, depending on the type of project where it's at um, yeah it, it's right now a challenge for our staff we're having to cut a lot of the projects back or you know change scope of work and minimize what we're doing out there and, and we're even discussing some of them delaying just because you know, got to sacrifice some projects to, to deliver others. So we're trying to prioritize and figure out that in our long, longer range plan. But, um, okay, I won't tell you about the holes in the road near Algebra then. <laughs> <laughs> you can just delay that. Probably no. We're here to listen, so <laughs> anything you'd like to share. That's Eagle County. We don't talk Eagle County. <laughs> um, page eight, um, as you know, Glenwood Canyon corridor. We have Andrew and Roland here. have been dealing with Glenwood Canyon for years. They're our local experts. Uh, um, they can kind of go into some of the details if you'd like. Uh, a lot there. A uh, the huge story, as you know. Right now where we're at is in finishing up some of the repair work. As you can see, uh, over $36 million, uh, in emergency repairs done. They've done a great job. The contractor coming in, getting everything back together. Hopefully by the end of the summer, we kind of have it in place. Um, what, what's that? this photo? What, the photo is intriguing because I can't tell which side you know, <laughs> anything's on, and I don't know where that is in the in the canyon. But wh where is that? Exactly. Do you anybody know? That mom, yeah, the, oh, the yeah, you don't. Know. Or Don? Don, Don, Don might be. Is it Blue Gulch? Okay. I took that from the helicopter doing damage and stuff. 
Oh, it's from the helicopter. Okay. I was thinking, yeah, what road did you take that? that that's okay. interstate below that picture. That's amazing. I mean, it's buried. And that's yeah, it's gone. what they were yeah. dealing with out there trying to to remove that debris. <laughs> so, so insane. Um, I have to tell you, it's amazing what you guys have done. Yeah. Watching the progress, watching those excavators in there, watching the bulldozers. What I I don't know how. I don't know how you accomplished what you've accomplished there. It is exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> and I've talked with Joe Elson a lot about it, and he doesn't get it either. So I think we're all on the same page. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, alternative routes over Independence Pass, of course. And I see the next page is about Cottonwood, so looking forward to you talking about that. But So do we have any predilection about what 82 might look like the next time we have a event like this? or <laughs> 82 over Independence, I mean. Over Independence, depending on the time of year as we all know um yeah right now we don't have anything planned on independence for any modifications changes uh really the the, the narrows area we're talking about what we can do to signalize that more permanent uh, because that is an issue and if we're going to use it to, uh, more on a regular basis we need to make sure we have something up there and uh, mark back here in the corner and andrew and roland can speak to this a little more i know they've been in some discussions uh and they can chime in on 82 if you guys like if you have any more details than that i don't know well i sure. talked to the gentleman from the federal highway authority and he was like well we're just thinking about widening the narrows i said have you been up there <laughs> because those boulders are not boulders that's like a whole rock wall and you would be shutting down independence pass for a season and that would really not be beneficial to anyone. And we've Very had people challenge. complain about the signals, but you know what? It's not that much time. It just seems so weird to come around a corner and see a red light in the middle of Independence Pass, in the middle of the wilderness up there. But you know, it works. And we don't have people freezing up in the middle of the highway, you know, literally having to get a police or a sheriff's officer up there to literally walk Welcome. them through the narrows. Um, so yeah, a permanent kind of facility up there, I think, is probably the direction that I think everybody's going to be headed. So, unless I'm way off base there. I know we've had some discussions on what we can do to get the signals to interconnect and, and talk to each other, so they're more in sequence. So you're not having to wait as long. You know, anything we can do to to make that more efficient, you know, and minimize the wait time. This is beautiful where you're waiting. So, yeah, wait it's not is, that long. The wait is short. Compared to waiting for somebody from Kansas who's freaked out in the middle of the road, not, nobody's moving. <laughs> so it's, it, that it happens a lot. Be a major project, like no you said. No offense to anybody from Kansas. The terrain and is very challenging. They actually may be from Denver and they're freaked out in the middle of the road. <laughs> Steve. So please. yeah, I was going to say if you could do a smart light system, like the other morning about five in the morning, I was going through there. I, I get stopped by the red light. I could. I didn't. I waited till it turned green, but I could tell by it, there's no headlights <laughs> no, coming nobody's down. Coming. I thought, you know, I'm probably safe to drive through it. But if it was a smart one that just sensed there's somebody here waiting on the red, there's nobody else coming the other way to have it go ahead and switch right then, that yeah. would just. No, we agree that ultimately that would that'd be the goal if we could have something in there. Motorists that. more happy. Yeah, exactly. Steve, so you know they take pictures of your license plate if you run the red light. <laughs> I was in the county car, so I think I was safe. <laughs> <laughs> that makes and he wears a mask. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, Greg, I was wondering kinda... regarding the, you know, the over 35 foot truck is the, is the biggest problem because what those guys get stuck, as you know, it shuts things down completely. It's like a rock slide. Um, uh, are there solutions? You know, is that is that a CSP issue or is that a C dot and CSP issue? Do, like, can we build a chicane that won't allow a 35 foot truck through, or what do we do? Uh, yeah, again, it's really the only way to bring it up to the current standards is to have a, a full blown, you know, reconstruction project in there and, and straighten out the alignment and widen it out. Oh, I was thinking about trying to just make it harder for them even to get in. You know, so they and, don't, and then to make it harder, you know, that's a challenge in itself because yes. It, it, it does provide a benefit. It is a state highway. Um, I don't know if Mark, you've been in uh, any you discussions need, you need about. You need to come up and get on a microphone. We're going to put <laughs> you guys come on the hot seat. Yeah. Yeah. We're spreading it around. Come. You guys can make your way up yeah, at these right. discussions with Cottonwood and Glenwood. And Brian, this is actually ticking off some of the stuff on our list too, so we're good. <laughs> Thank you. 
So a few years ago, we worked uh, with the county on some solutions to that. Um, part of it was the county paved the turnarounds, or was looking at paving it, and then ended up moving it to the gate where it wasn't necessarily needed to be paved. We put up the sign that flashes, and minimal compliance to that. <laughs> you know, they're already that far in. Someone's just going to try anyway and, and go over the pass. So we would looked at the chicane option at at one of the possible turnarounds, you know, where you'd have race medians, uh, guardrail, other things like that, that a truck over 35 feet could not make one of the turns to continue down the pass. They would be forced to make a U-turn and, and turn back. And at that point, there was not the, the will to possibly damage trucks that were going to try anyway. Under the current scenario and how things are continuing to go, maybe that will is there now to, that we could investigate that again with the county on a more permanent solution that would be much, much harder for a truck over 35 to get through. But it would certainly take a lot of will on both sides to, to do that because trucks will get damaged. If, if Glenwood Canyon shuts down again, it gets a lot, it makes much more sense as soon as that road closes over there, um, you know, just the cost of shutting, shutting down I keep thinking that you know it's a tough it's a tough one it's a really a tough one for people but um, if we shut 82 down as well because a truck is stuck then boy yeah. it's, it gets really interesting and that was one of the things that was brought up is like well if a t truck tries to go through this chicane thing and gets hung up and then has to be removed well it's still blocking the highway well it's better to block it there than farther up the pass because uh, yeah. law enforcement and the tow truck can get to that quicker and could pull it out of that area sooner versus farther up the pass. Or rather than have it roll off the pass and end up in our river full of diesel fuel. And where would that yeah. be? It's right at the By gate. The gate. Uh, there was a spot before the gates uh, where there was a wide area on the, on the right side as you were headed up. Going up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically bit. you'd come along to one of the turnouts and the, everyone would be forced to the right into the turnout. And like you're going into a U-turn and then at the last second, you'd be able to make a hard right to continue up the pass. And if you were over 35 feet, you wouldn't fit. You wouldn't be able to make the hard right to continue on. Like you could complete the U-turn. Yes. So oh, trucks over 35 would already be in, in a U-turn maneuver. And then you'd have to make a hard right to get out of it. And are tractors without trailers allowed over the pass? Sure. As long as you're under 35 feet. OK, Kelly. Um, can we add this topic for discussion with Lake County? Yeah, just touch, touch I think it was it. on our, but yeah, let's put it on there with our. We're, we're meeting with them next month. Yeah. That would be great to push well, we it might, with them. Yeah, you know, we we had discussions about. with them uh, four or five years ago, and they're like, it's really not our problem. The, the problem's on the Aspen pit side, so they weren't interested in talking. Except for the problem is most of the trucks we're finding are coming from Lake County. <laughs> And I know they have an issue with, with staffing. Yeah. They don't really have the staff, the sheriff's deputies that can be, yeah. you know, yeah. on alert there. They have a great mannequin, though. And that we want, we want their fake sheriff's car to park. <laughs> <laughs> but good, they keep moving in and keeps tricking me every time. But just so you know, it seems really odd when we're sitting here in our meeting room and you see a Walmart double trailer going eastbound and you know there's not a Walmart at this end of town. <laughs> so, yeah, and then about half an hour later or so, you see him going westbound, <laughs> hopefully. You hopefully. don't see him going all the way over, but, yeah. Yeah. And we definitely, so, so CDOT would support, you know, the conversation between uh, Pitkin and Lake on some yeah. more permanent solutions on preventing those trucks over the pass. It's amazing, all the signage, and they, they just... Well, the alternative is, is a long way around. Yeah. And if you're getting paid to get your load there... But when you get caught, it's a longer wait because mm -hmm. you don't get to leave until you've paid your fine yeah. and you're for sure <clears throat> going back the other way, hopefully. Yeah. So, yeah, we appreciate any efforts. And I know um, Cottonwood is next, so. Yeah, let's hear about that. Yeah, so as you can kind of see the graphic there, you've probably heard some mm -hmm. about the, you know, us looking into Cottonwood and trying to assist okay. the counties with uh, looking at that route and whenever I-70 goes down. So right now they've identified the 14 locations that need improvements, um, kind of to widen out curves 
and then that blue hill area that's pointed out is, is the narrow section and it gets signaled or it gets um you know with the flag with the flaggers on occasion whenever we need it we're using it as a detour route uh that definitely comes with its challenges uh, right now cdot's kind of the partner at the table uh we're not leading the effort we're just trying to to help the the communities along um identify the challenges uh still looking at you know it's a major project we don't even know what the final scope would be right now they're looking at just the, the minor improvements with cdot's you know assistance but there's there's also discussion about major improvements up there and how, what that would look like and as we know that that would definitely take a major undertaking uh, with the uh, NEPA process uh, looking at everything right away everything all the challenges in, included with it so um, we, we use it as just we don't post it but it's getting used whenever I 70s going down as everybody knows um, and, and there's the multiple options uh, to connect on that south end and they're running through the analysis of which is the preferred option route and, and I think the team's kind of figured out that the, I think it was the, the Catherine uh, store there area that would be the the preferred alternative and to bring the detour out in so right now it's still again at the early stages so I'll welcome any questions well I think Brian and I have talked just briefly about just keeping picking county in the loop because we're definitely impacted by the Glenwood Canyon closures um, and we will we'll be anticipating a lot of people who live on this side of Cottonwood are not going to be happy. And I know the people on the Gypsum side are not happy because it comes right through downtown, right through, they're right by their library and their puppy park and their, you know, and their town hall. So, yeah, it never seems to get easy, but it's also interfering with my going to Costco, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice round. <route. laughs> Are there capacity studies about these envisioned improvements? Yeah, Mark, is this to have? I, as far as capacity stays right now. You have to come up. Yep. Okay. I've got to get you on the mic now. Yep. So, honestly, the capacity studies aren't really there. We're not to that point. Right now, it's just right away and safety mm -hmm. um, because we've felt the need is, is there for that. So that's what the Transportation Commission, I really should have Kathy here more, but that's what the Transportation Commission has kind of put the money to. This came from TC. Well, I was I'll just, get well, I'm not, that's right, I'll, I'll sit right here. Yeah, you just go I ahead was, and take that seat. Okay. And then just, Steve, make sure her mic's on there. I'll, I'll sit up here and pretend like I know something, which I don't. We but, know you know everything. <laughs> You've been here a long time, you know it. <laughs> um, the, the commission did uh, appoint a million dollars to, uh, to to because it is a very important safety issue so the commission back in i think it was may yeah uh, it was when, may appointed a million dollars to that project because it's actually wasn't even a, a right-of-way road at this point from what i understand and so they're to determine that it you know the right-of-way for the road because this is all county yeah this is all mm -hmm. county and we're just getting the right-of-way done to see okay exactly where can we widen where can we look at and right now it's just strictly safety but it's your responsibility not the county no it's county it's this, county these are county roads this is eagle and garfield county roads and it's in, we're just in, being a partner at the table trying to help them yeah. the, you know kick it off with the million dollars ultimately it'll be their decision of what they want to do i see plus they they have they're having a series of public meetings uh with the community because of you just said uh, there's certainly a lot of people that are not going to be happy about that and so um, I went up to that 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 county meeting it was in the light uh, in the, the public uh, uh, meeting the Eagle area. County building in in in, uh, in Glenwood, Springs. Oh, Glenwood yeah and it was uh, several hours and they had the drawings of, of all of this and the possibilities of, of how to fix it and so it was a it was really well attended I, I was on my way to the CDOT meeting commission meeting so I stopped in there and spent that three hours with it just listening to people and and uh, yeah people are, are, are not happy and so but this is going to be an issue for 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 the two counties uh to eagle and and garfield because it is their their property and they're very at this point quite adamant they want it to stay in county and um, so the decisions and so what we can do to help them because um, it is a safety issue and so what we can do to help them is where we are 
Because I know that there's some places there that have been identified as the places where the road is narrow and we've had accidents there with people rolling off the side of the road. So I know that there's some very clear spots along Cottonwood that are, besides that, it's beautiful once you get up in there. See, and that's the, there's a lot of discussion. Um, talked with FHWA on this, and there's a lot to be discussed. But right now it's Eagle and Garfield counties that have to kind of lead the direction. We're just there to kind of help a little bit from the damage that's been done and just like look at right away right now. That's all CDOT's participation is. is, is. And, and is I, it Forest I, Service jurisdiction as well? Uh, I think it's a county road. I don't it's think it's county Forest road. There's road. some areas where there's not where there's any easements that aren't owned by the it, county because the road is yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest so that's issue. That's what I'm wondering. Lands, but the if other thing too yeah. is um, I think Picking County just wants to be a good neighbor in the discussions. I understand. And since we are definitely impacted when the closure comes through. Uh, Greg, please. I just want to, I don't know if you knew the, the history, um, but I, one of our early county commissioners, Tom Sardi, who also got our airport going back in the 50s, um, was an advocate that I-70 go that route back mm -hmm. before I-70 went through the canyon. And, and that was his advocacy, I think, back in the must have been sometime in the 50s. And uh, from what I understand on the EA on the canyon, that was looked at, but the, that was not considered, yeah, so Perfect. it is in the More EA. difficult than the canyon. Yeah. That's Gosh, hard to challenges. imagine, but. Yeah, I, think I think the thing with was land a, ownership was more difficult than the canyon. Even then, huh? I think there were three areas that, that the EIS studied to try to take it through there. That was one of them, and the canyon and over flat tops wilderness was wow. the other. Wow, the canyon was the easier choice. That's really surprising to me. Because it seems, we, <laughs> especially these see, days. <laughs> we, live on the, we live on the west side of the Rockies, and so those are, those are the challenges yeah, that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tough calls. Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any All more right. questions? I guess Glenwood we got, Canyon, we got Cottonwood. Cottonwood Pass solved. Now we can. <laughs> um, it's one, ongoing, and it, there'll be a lot more discussions to one come. One Glenwood Canyon question: uh, With the rainfall we've had this summer, uh, how big have debris flows been compared to two summers ago? And I'll let Andrew. DJ or somebody, but very minor, honestly. So I've uh, been pleasantly surprised. So do you remember the rain gauges or what we've received so far, Andrew? Uh, Andrew Owen, or kind of stay on top of that one. But as far as debris flows, we've only had some the minor ones across the bike path, and we had two slight floodings on the interstate. So as far as debris flow from my side cleaning up, it's been fairly low, but I know Andrew's been with USGS. So Andrew, if you want to say anything, you need to come up to a mic. We got an extra chair up here. <laughs> come on up. Andrew's always so shy. We know Andrew. <laughs> you might talk a little bit about what the Forest Service is, I mean, what you're trying to do up at the top as well. Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Um, so, you know, we've been in close coordination between the Weather Service and the U.S. Geologic Service, you know, monitoring the rainfall rates that the burn scar has received. You know, we've had a great partnership between uh, the Middle Colorado Watershed District and uh, some other funding agencies that assisted in getting the rain gauges around the perimeter of the burn scar. And CDOT owns two rain gauges as well around that perimeter. And the USGS is consistently monitoring the returns on those rain gauges and reaching out to CDOT to see, you know, if, if we've seen any debris flow events when those rainfalls exceed the thresholds that have been established. And like TJ said, fortunately this year, we really haven't had any, you know, debris flows, major debris flows of note that have impacted the highway corridor, which is great in my book uh, and hopefully everyone else's. Is, is uh, that luck? Or is it, uh, you know, I don't think the root systems are, have regrown yet. You know, they're, it, it's not an exact science. You know, it's really hard to speak with uh, broad strokes over multiple thousands of acres of the forest. Um, as you probably know, the west end of the canyon is pretty different from the east end of the canyon. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we were so thoroughly flushed last year. You know, in some locations, especially in Blue Gulch, uh, the bottom of which you see in that photo, uh, it was scoured down to bedrock in the uplands areas. Uh, you might think, you know, a lot of our debris might be being generated off the vast acreage of burn areas, but what we've seen is most of the debris is generated from within the channels themselves. 
you know, the burn area reduces the infiltration of the water and the rainfall. So you're seeing higher flows within those channels and uh, they start generating energy and start picking up material. And it's kind of a conglomeration effect, kind of like a pinwheel rolling down the snow, getting larger as it goes. And we've seen from our LIDAR surveys, you know, where that head cut starts and then carries down to that cliff band in Blue Gulch. And it's gone all the way down to bedrock in a lot of those locations. Um, and just a fun, fun fact for you guys at the bo bottom of that cliff band above Blue Gulch, there is a 50 foot scour hole that was opened up when all that debris cascaded off the cliffs. Um, so it's helpful that we've been scoured down to bedrock. We can't say that the hazard is over because in a lot of these locations, those channels, their side slopes are over steepened and they will, you know, as time progresses, they will lay back to stable slope angles. That material will, you know, be redeposited in the bottom of those channels and be available to be moved again in another major event. You know, it's probably going to take, you know, intensities that are, you know, commensurate with the previous intensities that created the past debris flows, but you won't be able to get any scientists to go on record and say you anything with definity well, uh, for the burn scar. You made that very clear. Thank you. Yeah. What is the <laughs> threshold amount of rain before you put out a watch? Uh, it's a quarter inch and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through that tracking with the USGS that's been uh, going on the past two years, you know, they, they've been tracking every rain event and its intensity and correlating those to the debris flows. This, uh, you know, past year, we've had a handful of events that exceeded our established threshold and nothing happened uh, as far as major debris impacts to the corridor, which is, a, you know, a great sign of recovery in the canyon. You know, I've seen it myself in our site visits into the canyon and, you know, in the areas where we've got mild and moderate burn severity that uh, regeneration is robust. You know, the the rain we have had this year you know, feels like kind of a more typical monsoon season. Uh, it's been beneficial for that recovery in areas like oak brush. You can see that new growth is three, three foot high or so because that oak brush, that root system can, you know, sprout out new growth pretty quickly. But the areas, you know, higher burn severity areas, dark timber areas where it really burned hot, it's going to take a long time for that recovery, and I, I don't know if it'll ever look like it did before, you know, because we know our climate conditions are going to be different into the future than they were when that, those areas came to be as they are. So it's just something we'll be continuing to track. All bets are off. Yeah, and I had heard <laughs> from the forest that, um, that it was surprisingly that a lot of the, the debris areas weren't really the areas that were severely burned. It was just weird in that there's still a lot of stuff up there. And as we know, a lot of that stuff up there eventually will come down. So we just, and I appreciate your, some people say, oh, they're overly cautious, but you know, in reading the newspapers and seeing people that are perishing in fl flash floods throughout the, wet, throughout the country um, these days, um, it's better to be safe than sorry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have been, you know, in close coordination with the Forest Service as well. You know, as you likely know, it's a highway easement deed through the canyon where we don't own full right of way and us uh, require close coordination with the forest for everything we do in the canyon. Uh, there was regular and close engagement when we were working the river to clear out those debris piles to prepare for the spring runoff, and that was a resounding success. We didn't have any damage during spring runoff. It wasn't a huge runoff either, so we'll see what, what the future brings. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been a good collaboration. And we've made some requests for some work in the uplands uh, for the Forest Service to perform, and hopefully they'll be able to do that as well. Where did all the debris go? Um, which de which exactly that debris? huge pile that was right next to the highway <laughs> uh -huh. for a long time where did, did you move it all to i mean uh so it went to a, a variety of destinations uh one spot is flag sand and gravel in the silt area 
which is in the process of reclaiming some of their gravel mining pits. Oh, perfect. Uh, the, uh, another contractor took possession of some of that material to reprocess it into resaleable sand and aggregates oh, as yeah. well. That's great. Uh, we had, during the heat of the emergency, our maintenance forces trucked a lot of that material along to uh, Highway 82 across we have a new red berm there. Aspen Glen. That revegetation mm -hmm, seems to be going nice. well. Uh, they did a good job kind of, you know, grading that into nice rolling hills uh, and preparing it to be able to receive future debris uh, <laughs> whenever that might happen. Uh, so, yeah, it's been going to a lot of places. Uh, we have a contractor right now constructing additional mitigation in the canyon. Uh, some of that are gabion baskets uh, on the north side of the interstate to prevent some of that material from, you know, going onto the highway and having to be cleaned up immediately. And they are mining some of those debris wasting sites to get rocks that can be reused in those gabion baskets as well. Uh, so it's, it's gone a lot of places. I Thank you. In, That's in, so interesting. In, in lay terms, <laughs> using the word, I notice has been come through. They're 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 digging some pretty deep channels on the the north side where it's catching it. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. So uh, it's a nice fancy name, but I was noticing and coming through the canyon like I've been doing a lot where they're where they where they can hold that water before the rush across the yeah across debris the storage system. basins. Right. You might have heard our right. chief engineer call them bathtubs. I I, guess yeah, so, that's a layman term for them as well. And now they're on the uphill side of the highway. On the uphill side, mm -hmm. yep. And then if you drive through, you'll see them. You can see the big. Yep. Cool. And then the gabion baskets are installed in conjunction with those excavated storage basins just to further increase their storage capacities. Oh, that's really we cool. We also like all the bruise nets. All the what? Bruise nets. We became very familiar with rock oh, ball and catch -alls. We We have some along Shale Bluffs. We also have installed some in our private development within the valley. So. Yeah, Geo Brook is going to be supplying uh, three more debris flow catchment fences. We are installing one at the milepost 120 area near where the fire started. And then we have two that are gonna be installed in series in the Blue Gulch channel. Um, and you know, hopefully those help mitigate future debris events. You know, if we had those installed before the major events, uh, everywhere we had them anchored to is currently in the river or down in silt, so <laughs> it would have been more to clean up, but... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, hopefully they, they help out in the future events. A new have been engineering chapter for Glenwood Canyon, which has yeah. had some pretty incredible engineering. It's definitely it's changed the course of the river. But it's okay. a, Yeah, it's a nonstop challenge. In yeah. the You've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, the, you know, Glenwood's been a very taxing for our staff. You know, Dawn and TJ, they'll start out with the event itself, or the events, I guess, uh, fires and floods. It, it really <laughs> jumped in and... and you know, used their resources to get it stabilized and then Andrew and Roland, you know, came back in and then tried it with our engineering projects and contractors to get everything stabilized and still working on it today. So these unplanned events are challenging for us, um, but the team stepped up and done a great job. I mean, like I said. Yeah, fact, yeah I think everybody in the valley was amazed how fast the canyon opened after you that. You guys were amazing. It was and incredible. <laughs> and I have to tell you, it's become a tourist attraction for small children, especially boys who love nothing better than looking at all those trucks. <laughs> right. That's the highlight of the drive to Costco, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we move along here since we've got about a half an hour. Yeah, we'll, and we've we'll got speed up a little bit here and kind of blow our, through. It's, it's us. It's, we've been the ones. Feel free to stop me wherever you'd like. Um, but, yeah, they'll pass. don't know how detailed you want, but you've got some information here. It's probably our largest job right now in Region mm -hmm. 3. Uh, it's ongoing. You see that there's really a series of projects here uh, with five what we call CAPS, it's a CMGC project with our contractors up there. And uh, right now we're kind of in that, you know, third and fourth phase of design, construction, pushing things through. We've got the truck ramp completed. We're working on the bike path right now, and then the bridge replacement, and then the roadway coming along behind. The final bridge will take place in, a, in 2024. Um, could you talk a little bit about the variable speed limit signs, which are, I'd love to... Well, that's an intriguing thought. Our, currently, the speed, the actual speed on 82 is about 70, as you may have noticed. <laughs> but the speed limit signs, you know, don't seem to be having much effect. I'm wondering if variable makes a difference. And then also, 
uh, wildlife underpasses this comes people call me all the time and ask why we don't have them because you know, we had a raft of us take out 10 elk in one go and a regular passenger car took out five a couple winters ago right down here by shale bluffs and you know, brush creek turnoff and so we're talking wildlife overpasses so it's great to see you're doing them just bring some over here yeah we, we've <laughs> changed over the years right i mean we're, we're becoming more uh, con context sensitive you're really looking at all those different things that we are impacting uh, when i'm being wildlife trying to figure out how we mitigate more than block you know and divide so so we're focusing more and we're getting more partnerships uh, we've done studies in the region on corridors uh you know, some of their uh, migration routes. We're really starting to understand more and more uh, as we go. This is one of those areas that, uh, yeah, we're able to take advantage of it. We have a major project and we're, we're able to install some infrastructure along with, you know, Highway 13 is another one of our major corridors that we've really been looking at and trying to change the way we've done it. 20 years ago, we weren't building any infrastructure up there for wildlife to speak of. Is that north of uh, Silverthorn, up like that? Highway that 13? Uh, no, that? it's north of Red Rifle. Up okay, that's the Craig okay, area. Is there. Okay. Highway 9, though, north of Silverthorn. That's the one we I, did yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah, some beautiful That was kind of the catalyst there. that really changed yeah. the way we're looking the first at things. I look at that with envy. Kind of our model, yeah. Yeah, it's really helped Stars us kind aligned of. on that one. That a lot a, of studies with it and, and learning. That was the very first one that right. we did since it, you know, really first one, and it was really, it's really put the cameras in there, and immediately all the different kinds of wildlife used it. So we learned from that that they right. really do work, and so there's been an awful lot of wildlife that's put into our 10-year plan. So yeah, we see reductions, 92, 95 percent mm -hmm. reduction on wildlife collisions in areas. Yeah. So, well, but the bad part is it's, it, it takes a lot of money, the infrastructure. It's, yeah. it's, it's new structures, yeah. larger structures, and they're very costly. And, and so trying to get those partnerships that we've been working on, um, figuring out other funding sources that can help us. It takes the right, right away, too, because you have to have protected locations. For yeah, it's a mm -hmm. land ownership factor as well. Right. You know. And for us, it's a scenic view plane. Yeah, I saw one down near Bayfield that was yep. an overpass um, that was just beautiful. It was beautifully constructed. It was actually, a, you know, it wasn't an eyesore in this last little bit. Yeah. It was so beautiful. Yeah, I was really to shocked. Look at. They're awesome when you see something up there, a moose or a, an elk yeah. or deer on them, right? It's just that's kind of fascinating. Kind of a distraction <laughs> going away, too. Yeah, you know? well, we have a study that's been going on. Greg, what's the, the, the heritage? Uh, na the Colorado Natural Heritage Program out of CSU. And, it's, and here it's the Watershed Biodiversity Initiative where they're trying to really map those corridors. And you see all the north-south migrations across our east-west highways. Yeah. Um, and you, you guys probably know about that, but we've got a lot of study, study of that being undertaken. Yeah, we have, now. we have it done here, and it's with Tom Cardamone. It's just kind of coming out, and it's really interactive. So when we get an update on that, we'll make sure to loop you guys in. Well, we completed a pretty comprehensive study about a year or two ago. We called it the West Slope Wildlife Prioritization Study, and CPW did it in conjunction with CDOT, along with a team of wildlife biologists who are consultants. And I thought they did a really good job of looking at the entire West Slope, and they looked at a number of factors. They looked at land ownership was very important, as Jason mentioned, because you can't really build wildlife underpasses and overpasses if the landowner isn't friendly and doesn't want it. Yeah. We've had that happen before, or we've had to move an overpass to federal lands, to BLM lands. So that's an important factor. We look at um, summer and winter range, and also um, linkages between the summer and winter range, the, the migratory habits of big game and also wildlife vehicle collisions. Those are kind of the three factors that we consider and we come up with a ranking score. And basically there was just so many projects, as you can imagine, that came out of it throughout the state that we're having to really prioritize and just look at that top five to 10%, um, the basically 90th percentile and above across the state. We and so those are the ones that we're focusing on now. You guys do have an area, and I'll pass this around, um, milepost 27 to 28 that came up in that percentile. Um, I'll pass it around, and you guys can look Elderbell. at it and keep it. And Between Elderbell and Catherine's store, I think. Yeah, and I can email you electronically the report if you want it. But, but that is a high-priority area, and so that's something that we would definitely be interested in addressing with you guys, and certainly areas outside. 
I'm sorry. It's eagle. Oh. Um, oh, I th I'm sorry. I thought it was picking. Not they're talking C Catherine Storr. Well, we'll see. But we support it. I could okay. be wrong. <laughs> it's in Garfield <laughs> yeah, County. And I yeah, we'll, Garfield. Yeah. I had talked to Brian about That was the about only hot lights. spot on 82. About lights, just mm -hmm. the flashing lights. Um, something that would be less costly and is effective in some ways, and maybe that's a good interim until, and I don't want to say we climb up the list because we don't want to really climb up that list of more interactions. Yeah. But... Yeah. You're right, it's cheaper, and we're actually trying that on State Highway 13. We're just now installing it. And so we're doing kind of an experiment with CPW, and we're anxious to see if it works uh, because it's, a, it's an actual sensor and detector. Detects the presence of wildlife approaching the road. It's supposed to be pretty accurate. So we'll see if it works. If it works, we'll certainly we'll try it out elsewhere. You. you might be picking. Great. Yeah. Kelly, go ahead. Here, it Are might we, be picking. Would we be able to make our pitch if we find other locations that um, perhaps could meet your criteria? Um, yes. I'm just thinking when we heard the presentation from the Biodiversity Initiative, there were some places in Snowmass Canyon that, you know, it might be state land on one side and county land on the other side that perhaps could um, yes. resolve, you know, those concerns as well as um, you know getting that safety benefit for the wildlife that we've identified at least locally and how absolutely would you do that? Um, there are there are citizen groups that mm -hmm. are that we're working with right now there's actually a, a summit county safe passages group that they're called um, they're they're an NGO we're actually meeting with them next Monday we're going out there they're proposing a wildlife overpass in the East Vale Pass area on I-70. So they're conducting a field tour out there and they're working on fundraisers right now in conjunction with uh, Vale Ski Area and Copper Mountain and others. And there's also becoming a lot more uh, private and uh, more federal funding opportunities that are coming available, um, state and federal funding opportunities for that. So matching grant type of stuff where you can you know, raise some money and then go out after matching grants. So we're seeing a lot more of that too. So there are definitely those partnership opportunities out there. What's an estimated cost of an overpass? An overpass is generally in the one to two million dollar range. And underpass is twice Underpass is like a million and less. Oh, Five, it's less. Half million to a million, yes. What did you say for the overpass, how much? Usually about $2 million. Only, only two? I thought we were talking like 10 to 20, well, no, 30. I'm, I'm Depends how many lanes, the size of the structure. It might be closer to three yeah. by now. I don't exactly. know. Wow. <laughs> Can we lock that in? That's if you're on I-70 and silt. Yeah, this was, was State Highway 9, so it could, right it could have gone up in the last couple of years. lane facility. I can't read the answer. Okay, but it's, you know, it's I'm going to move us into cleaning the highway, because I think we have a bunch of issues we can compact into one. Can we keep this? <laughs> yes, please keep that, and I'll, I'll be happy to email it to you. So, as, well. as far as the highway Great. cleaning, we have issues with the Del Winnie signs that are still on the highway. We don't believe Del Winnie is still participating in that program. We'd like those <laughs> signs to be gone. As you know, we've wanted them to be gone even before we found they were put up. Um, the other issue is cleaning through shale bluffs. We've got a lot of overspill, and we've got people who do ride their bikes through shale bluffs. Crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm just trying to, um, and then Brian, we had talked with Brian about maybe the county finding out what the cost would be to, we did the cleanup between say the airport and the landfill where we seem to have more of the trash that's on the highway from trucks going to and from the landfill. So yeah, Brian, so, I'm gonna uh, turn it over. Thank you. Uh, I've been in conversation with uh, Bernard Cole who's in charge of the highway cleanup program. And uh, Del Winnie's contract goes through the end of March of 2023. At that point, Pitkin County will be able to take it over. Uh, according to Bernard, he's gonna allow the local agency to take that over. Uh, that's in the budget for 2023. And right now we're at $60,000 to uh, cover a full year. So uh, I, I, I expect that uh, cost to be under the 60, but that was uh, to cover our, and all of our expenses. And the signs will come down. And the signs will come down. And if you wanted uh, 16 Pitkin County signs to go up, we can. <laughs> or we could have one at either end of that area. And then we would take on the cleanup? Is that it? Yeah, we that would the... pay the contractor to do the cleaning. If they're 
did they ever show up? I, 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 I think they've I saw actually, them a couple times. They've been cleaning uh, pretty yeah, regularly. I noticed yeah. Yeah, yesterday so. or the day before, they must have known you guys were coming because the highway looked pretty clean. They're going to be like, that's pretty impressive up here. The so it's a matter of just footing the bill for the cost of the cleanup. Yeah, go ahead, Kelly. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Brian. I really appreciate this resolution to this because it's mm -hmm. been aggravating me a lot. <laughs> and I'm glad that we're not just reopening that um, contract because, you know, there's there are other people who are buying up that advertising in other parts of Picking County once you get closer to Basalt. So I don't want to just create another opportunity that will continue to frustrate. Yeah. Um, thank you. And I don't need any Picking County signs. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, the other question is to the cleaning of the rock, the, the shale on shale bluffs and the, the, little, the shoulder, which would be on the eastbound well, side. Well, it's both directions, but eastbound. Yeah, but yeah. mostly the shale stuff. So we don't have a street sweeper, right, Brian? We do. Well, we do. Yes. Oh, yes, I was behind it the other day. Well, oh, that in. was the city's. <laughs> well, it's very slow. I think that was, we're going to blame that one on the city, I think. <laughs> yep, if you can come up, you gone. I knew we'd get you back up here on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's on our agenda to get, like we talked about, a lack of personnel and that. So Donna and I were talking on the way up of, how do we maybe use some of our resources that are coming on the weekends, doing guardrail, do we move them to help shell bluffs? And then the one question we had for Brian is, do you guys have a location to get rid of that? Because we have to, we're looking at hauling it clear down to Carbondale, and that's what takes forever to clean that area up is All the, the place shale that comes it. out of there? Yeah, because none of the pits, nobody wants it because it's not a really good. want shale. Yeah, it's Who not wants a great it in Carbondale? Up, so I thought it was going to catch Brian high afterwards value and stuff. see if there was a, Area of the county would need some fill or something that we could work at getting it off of there. So we're willing to, to talk to you. I know Brian has a great relationship with you guys. Yeah. So, so what would Carbondale do with it? Road improvement and stuff? Mm, they can't. Why really. would you haul it to Carbondale? Carbondale? Well, because down there by just across from Aspen Glen, so below. Yeah. That's where we have a st our closest storage area. Oh, and it might be dispersed anywhere from there. Yeah, well, right along from Aspen Glen, where we put a lot of the material from the canyon. You'll see it along there. There's a good oh, yeah, area there, and that's our I've closest stockpile to haul it from here. I see. It's either there or we have to go clear up to the base of McClure because of oh, yeah. rules. We, we can't just there. drop it anywhere in the right of way, so we have to have a <clears throat> designed and approved pit area for it. So yeah, I know the it makes I a long ways to haul and takes a lot more trucks and a lot more equipment. So well, let's see what we can do because I know a lot it's, more fuel, it's overflowing. A lot more emissions. Yeah. <laughs> and with shorthanded, less people, less trucks we have, the quicker we could do it if we could find a place here local so we'll work with Brian and you know just throw that out there I appreciate all the help from Brian and Picking County Sheriff's Department on all their help with the traffic control and semis and we try to get our folks up here but a lot of times the semis beat our guys up here so sure. they help us turn around and it's been a great partnership so is, is there any use for the Manco shale that that debris looks just like it might be so unstable and is it can you even use it as road base or does it just have to go into a hole somewhere Pretty much in a hole. Yeah. More, yeah, see, it's more not, fill it's underneath, and it no, can't be real deep, even as fill right. it doesn't work because it moves so kind much. Of stuff. So. Pulverizes, yeah. Yeah, and that's why nobody wants it. So. <laughs> and it's not select fill, so it's we don't right. want to use it in our <laughs> roadway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, don't want this yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I just, we just got to want to get some. So, yeah, it's on the list. Great. Well, thank thank you. I really appreciate you putting that on the list. And, Brian, I'm going to ask a real quick question about 82 again over the past. Did we get any number of tickets? I'm going to look at Parker. Parker's our Sheriff Department ops. We don't, okay, we're good. I think we had a good discussion on that. Um, the other one, with the, since we have the City of Aspen here too, we just had some issues about the record of decision for the entrance to Aspen. Um, I don't know if CDOT's prepared to give us any advice. <laughs> Everybody, I see everybody shaking their head back there. I, I think this that is one might of those very a, challenging conversations. I was eh? say, it's, <laughs> it, it's not easy how we proceed forward. I don't know, Dave. Do you have any, I guess, advice on next step where we stand today? I guess it just depends on what you guys are interested in doing. You know, if you're if you're going to make um, you know fairly dramatic changes from you know the FEIS. You know, of course, that was written back in '97 and the subsequent record of decision in 98 um, you know they we analyzed all the impacts obviously um, for the preferred alternative and and I think if you want to continue to move forward and, and follow that preferred alternative then it's a no-brainer right but obviously if you want to make changes to that 
then we need to go back in and, and reopen the NEPA process and right. analyze the impacts. And, you know, if, if the impacts are, are minimal, you know, then we could do, um, you know, a reevaluation, which, you know, is a relatively simple process, but it would still involve public comment, you know, and, and obviously there'd need to be consensus if there was a an outpouring of, of opposition, you know. Did you say consensus on the interest? <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> That's why I hate to open up the can of worms again. Because I'm kind of <laughs> looking at the city since right now. I mean, the city, I know the city's been talking about it more than the county. It just it would depend on where we decided to draw the line. Kelly? Yeah, I guess um, maybe it's an easier conversation about revisiting whether the the record of decision from basalt to the airport has delivered what it intended to um you know that is sort of within the county's purview um and and i just i guess i'd wondered if is there a process to evaluate if it did what it planned to do or not um is there a pathway then to revisit some of those decisions and the record of decision related to that. Yeah, certainly there is. I, I think it's probably going to involve a, a bigger separate meeting, to be honest with you. But I think we're certainly open to discussing, you know, an evaluation of, of the results and mm -hmm. and steps forward, you know, if necessary. We're certainly open and amenable to that. And and I know, you know, FHWA tends to like to be involved in those conversations as well. You know, certainly if federal funds are involved, I mean, it's a, it's a state highway, but if we wind up going in involving federal funds, they, they definitely need to be at the table as well. Um, and what is, I mean, I guess I just don't understand, like, what would the criteria be for that type of process, just in a real general way to revisit a record of decision and, um, you know, good question. Not something I do every day, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure there's a process for sitting down and, and evaluating the effectiveness of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not quite sure how to how okay. to begin that. I don't know if Andrew knows or Roland. But uh, no, I know there are guidelines. Having been involved with a different record of decision here in the valley, um, that goes way back, um, and it was amended. Um, multiple times, which was not hard. It was initiated by the Environmental Protection Agency. It was it Smuggler Superfund type? Okay. Um, and, but it's also my understanding that there's kind of a shelf life. So I think if anything, we might need we might be able to approach it in that manner. It's really with the partners with the City of Aspen, um, right. and and how, as to how and what and what the parameters would be. Um, but that would be would be my understanding. You'd open it up to revisit it because it's been on the shelf for a long time. Yeah, probably needs to be dusted off, I guess. Yeah, and, and, and that might be an opportunity to review what Kelly's asking for, the what, you know, what the progress has been and what outcomes have been and where we might want it to go in the future. And it could be, stands where it is, but it might yeah. be good for the community to know that we're taking a look at it with or the city of Aspen and we could, you know, be in partnership with that if we decided yeah. to go that route. But yeah, okay, uh, that was just a, simple question we wanted to throw out well the interesting <laughs> aspect you know there's different things right so there's the castle creek bridge which we just had some discussions on recently about you know the condition of the mm -hmm. structure itself and how to proceed forward you know rehabilitation replacement where do we go from here right that that, that structure is getting older um it's definitely needing some attention and so it's a, an investment decision on our part right and so that's a catalyst for what do we do right. how do we move forward and that's where I think we're all going to have to get to the table and decide the next steps. And, and since we're talking about that stretch of the highway, I want to just do a real quick thank you so it doesn't get missed at part of today's meeting. It's for the progress you've been doing on the project with the roundabout, which was awesome. The community was pretty, uh, pretty surprised that there were impacts, but not what the community was anticipating. And now it seems to be going. I mean, we still have some traffic snarls, but you know, you have those regardless. Um, but with the bridge, um, that's going to be really nice when that's done and when the that section is fully paved. I think it's from the ABC back to Castle Creek. And then Castle Creek Bridge starts. And we've been trying to let the community know that we're going to get it all done this year. So hopefully in the next few years out, it will just be minor things that need to be addressed, no major. I think that's 
where we'd like it to go and where we'd like, I think that's where the funding is going to take us. So we really appreciate your work that you've done there. It's been pretty awesome. Um, so we have some other things on our list. Um, you know, we've always had a concern at Smith Hill Road, the intersection there. Um, and I don't know if CDOT's has any great solutions to a very dangerous intersection. Um, we loved it during construction when there was a flagman out there every morning and every afternoon. I don't think that's feasible in the future. But Brian, did you want to pitch in anything with Smith Hill or? We keep bringing it back to Brian every. <laughs> I want to ask him about stoplights also. Yeah, so CDOT did, did some improvements there on the median and uh, for the D-cell lanes entering Smith Way. But, um, you know, I think we stopped short of looking at signalization for that, for that area. Uh, there was also improvement that CDOT completed to uh, elevate some lights and the stop sign for Smith Way. And so those safety improvements have been completed, but <coughs> that's it for now. Okay. There's nothing additional planned unless, uh, unless We're looking there's something so. that, that looked okay. We it. didn't think so. We just wanted uh, to make sure that it was still on our radar. So I don't it think we have bad. anything, but uh, yes, I yeah, I would be happy to sit down and look at it. You know, what's there? You know, the, yeah. the traffic department, uh, Andrew. It's and his pretty team. tricky. You think that's the most dangerous intersection on the in the county on the on the highway, I believe. That's considered the most dangerous intersection, um, but just, I don't know if that's still accurate. I thought it was gonna be way worse when during the roundabout construction. It really wasn't any different than any other time of year, which was pretty amazing. Yeah. Brian just brought up signalization. I, I know we only have, we have yeah. a couple of minutes left, but we hear rumors about new stop signals at the airport business center vicinity, maybe up to two or even three uh, within a pretty short span. Um, three? And I'm just wondering how are we all in the loop on this? <laughs> Doesn't CDOT have a distancing requirement between signals on a highway? There's, there's Has that been forgotten yes. in the upper Roaring Fork Valley? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been working with the developer and their consultants on the plan for that. There is an access control plan through there that shows uh, the signalization locations so that we don't end up with them too closely spaced. So it appears that with this development, a uh, new signal would go in and there'd be some other intersection modifications. But it's still in draft form, um, so we're not ready to issue any final say on what it would be. Obviously, it's not like we're trying to with withhold it from anyone here. We can certainly share that information with you, what we have so far. So that would be Owl Creek, the lumber yard, the existing signal to the ABC possible one either at the public works so that would be public works Owl Creek exists already well, that'd be years away right ABC exists well it's still a signal I, I don't recall right off I look at hundreds of these things <laughs> in the spirit of a month so I'd have to pull that back up and look at it to understand we to typically have a traffic backups that would be longer than the span between those proposed lights but as you know you know so that's pretty scary yeah, wondering, wondering how that's going to work. I think, I think those are all in the proposed, I'm looking at Brian again, in the access plan that, the access control plan that was passed and then revisited again over the last 20 years, I know for sure, so. Will roundabouts be considered there? We're always in favor of those, but um, it, it would be a challenge to make it work in that situation where the queuing so tight. is backing into it. I mean, you put a queue through a roundabout and you shut everything down. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we also have huge issues, I think, with utilities that run through that stretch of the highway. So yeah. that's another big one. Um, Steve has one really quick. He wants to know about Bustang. No, he no. is an avid Bustang rider. Actually, if I only have one minute to talk, I mean, I am a quite frequent Bustang rider. I really appreciate it. And I've gone clear from Grand Junction to Colorado Springs. At, uh, various stretches of it um, but I do have a question about or a concern about Highway 133 we hear from bicyclists that it used to be much safer they had kind of a paved shoulder they could ride on and and there was maybe less highway traffic but they had a place they could be on pavement and be out of the line of the traffic 
then CDOT did a paving project where they basically just paved from the white line to the white line, so the paved shoulder then was a drop off from the pavement down onto that, which then no longer made it usable by the bicyclists. So now they, people have just quit riding their bicycles on there because they feel very unsafe. They don't have a kind of an escape route. Um, and I think the solution would be if there's a, you know, if 133 were going to be paved again, just to go ahead and pave as wide as it used to be to incorporate, you know, a white line and then a, a little bit on outside the white line for the bicycles to be on. And I think that probably would help them a lot. And we've gotten multiple requests over the years from different residents up there. And we just got a recent people, request. Bicyclists who yeah. say they don't go there anymore because yeah. it's just is too dangerous for them now. Okay. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let us go a little over time so with the board because you do have a program update about your greenhouse gas program. And so if somebody can just give us a quick overview of that because that's uh, something of great concern to this board and I know with the City of Aspen's Climate Action Plan. Uh, yeah, we should get something real fast. Jump oh, up yeah, here. that'd be great. <laughs> I think give, give some direction. Yeah, so uh, what happened on 133 is over a couple construction projects, we implemented a heat and remix treatment to the highway, you know, hot in place asphalt recycling. Where, and then we laid it right back down to the white edge line, like you said. And then the intent with that treatment was to reuse the existing materials to reduce the amount of haul trucks to the highway uh, and be good stewards of our resources. Uh, you know, because we looked at a full width asphalt overlay for that highway section. And in order to address the potholing and rutting on that highway, it would have required a three inch asphalt lift, which would have been a lot more asphalt, a lot more trucking, a lot more cost. So instead, we implemented that in-place recycling treatment. And the intent is for that finished grade of the recycled service to match the shoulders. Obviously, it wasn't perfect in some spots. But after that was done, it was capped full width with a chip seal. Uh, and in conjunction you know, with talking with Brian, you know, we coordinated on the size of the chips and uh, made sure we used a smaller size chip that is more friendly to narrow tires for cyclists. Uh, but there are unfortunate locations where that lip may feel a little uncomfortable for those cyclists. Um, but we have completed the heat and remix for the corridor from Carbondale Town Limits up to the top of the pass. And we've chipped that. We have a chip uh, planned here in the future as well. Uh, to preserve that highway and minimize the amount of materials, costs, uh, greenhouse gases that uh, are required to keep that facility up and running. Hopefully that secondary chip helps to kind of fuzz out that lip a little bit in some locations, but you know that, that is something that will persist. Uh, and you know we are supportive of that uh, Carbondale to uh, Crested Butte Trail that's being planned by Open Space and Trails partially in Pitkin County. That would be a more long-term solution, we believe, for a, a safer and uh, more pleasant bike riding experience because widening along that 133 corridor is not very feasible due to the geographic constraints of the mountains and the river okay. in that location. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Steve, thanks for bringing that up. Okay, <laughs> quick overview of your greenhouse gas. Do you have anything you want to speak to on it, Ms. Kathy? No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It's been a, it was a, it's been a, argu uh, was an arduous year to be chairman because we, we had an awful lot of issues and this was one of our, our major issues, uh, that, because we're not used to having to do rulemaking. This was a rulemaking process that, right. that we're not accustomed to. So I'll let you. It's. It's it's in here and it has lots of ups and downs to it and um, as everything always does so 
it's going to be interesting to see how it how it works out through um, the the major MPOs that have to meet that this year. We'll see this their plans this year. So, do you have a certain goal within a certain time that you're trying? Yeah, exactly. To so if you kind of look at that second paragraph yeah. there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you look at those targets, there's set targets for 2025, you know, 2030, 2050. Um, they're pretty aggressive. Uh, if you look at the percentages, um, we're going to have some challenges ahead of us, and there's going to be some extreme things done to try to, to meet those targets. And right now, it looks like we're going to be able to meet the 2025 target. Uh, we're looking at the 2030 target to see if our projects, uh, we're trying to identify regionally significant projects. We're, we're, as we're modeling and said the MPOs all have their own models then we have a statewide model as they're running those we look at the major projects their impacts uh, look at all the mitigation going on all the other things we're doing um, the electric vehicles uh, with transit you know all these other initiatives and how they play a part of this uh, there's so much going into our modeling right now uh, th and, th and this is kind of one of those um, you're, you're leading the nation in it and you're trying to figure it out as you go kind of thing so a lot of challenges um, so uh, every month pretty much they're having to to amend the, uh, some of the rules the model mm -hmm. and, and look at the inputs and, and trying to modify uh, as we go along uh, right now we're kind of in those beginning stages really of getting that baseline set so once we have that now we can really start looking at what mitigation factors and how much they you know play a part in in the reduction themselves and if they don't meet the reductions then we have to start looking what else can we do well, and I think having this information, knowing CDOT's moving in this direction will be helpful for us in reaching our climate action goals um, in the upcoming outgoing years. So I think that's important. And I, I noticed we have things that we can follow up on on our own and, and, and keep keep track of you as we move along. Yeah, go ahead. Can I, can you, um, the last sentence on page 13, could you tease that out a little bit for me? Because um, I'm not sure which MPO we are in based on these acronyms and then i'm wondering when our next regularly scheduled plan update so an mpo is a metropolitan planning okay. organization and it's a federal designation uh -huh. and the only one we have in region three is grand junction and it's a grand valley mpo okay. you are part of the intermountain tpr uh -huh. and so the, the mpo sets rules for themselves because they're a federal designation then the state covers the rules for the intermountain tpr so when will that rulemaking for the rulemaking is going happen? on and I think September from the Transportation okay. Commission is is the deadline on that they went to into a 90-day emergency and they're you understand that better yeah. than I do the no, terms I was gonna say I'm not really sure now that you say that I'm, I'm, I'd have to but check I think in September October 1st is the deadline yeah that's right October 1st yeah okay but that doesn't affect you guys can I just ask um, how how deep are you going to be into uh, electric uh, charging infrastructure it seems that that's going to be a huge part of me reaching these goals is providing easy infrastructure for electric vehicle charging or you know charging networks whatever I, you know I, I know our own rafta electric buses could be twice as efficient if we had a charger on this end and we're I know the city's working on that um, in terms of miles traveled per you know per charge um, and I can see that happening across the entire country and, and the state too and there is a really good they did a really good presentation at our July stack meeting which is statewide transportation advisory committee and that's online and if you want I can send somebody on the board I'll just send Brian that link and sure. you can you talked about the charging it talked about that whole process and your representative who is Bentley Henderson out of Summit County was kind of on that and so he can it's it's all on there a lot of this just as an FYI I know we're way past time a lot of this is online we put the book online now when, and there's a lot of good information um, our information our email addresses and stuff are on there so if you have any questions you can get a hold of me easiest through Brian or I can just visit with you guys but yeah, there is a lot of good information on grants and other things in this book. And so if you have any questions, you can contact us or whatever. But yeah, we have a, a, a meeting with the city of Aspen at 2.30. Oh. So, oh, you've got to be there. Sorry. Okay. So did we, but did we cover all the questions that you had? Okay, great. Uh, probably not. I don't know. <laughs> no. Still on no, we appreciate it. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna bring us to. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's always it's always so good to see you. <laughs> nice to see and you. I'm really, I can talk to you about I'm really TPR bummed at the roundabout ribbon cutting. Oh, there wasn't a photo op with that deer standing yeah. behind us on the I corner. Know. That, that deer so was gorgeous. It, we we just go like, don't run out in the street. Don't come over <laughs> and see us. But yeah, that was amazing. And um, he wanted to be there to see what was happening. Yeah, he's he like, very, there must be yeah. food over there or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know if he was on contract or what. I don't know. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we stage him over there. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> Carefully. coming. Thanks for but bringing everybody. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, it's been a while. But thank you. If you have any follow up questions, we know where to find you. Thank you. You guys are doing amazing work. Cheers. Safe travels. You'll send the wildlife. Just have to get us some. Snow plow drivers up here. Okay, to the board. Grassroots. We're going to take 10.
Welcome back. Today is Tuesday, August the 23rd, 2022, Picking County Board of County Commissioners Work Session. Our next item on our agenda is the Central Mountain, Central Colorado Mountain River Basin Weather Modification Program presentation. I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed county attorney to do the introductions and open this session up. Thanks, Patty. You're welcome, John. So with us today in person, we have two representatives from the Colorado River District, Mike Keitel and Dave Kanzer. And uh, I don't know, Dave was running the program. I think Mike might not run it now. I'm not sure who's in charge. And <laughs> one of these guys, for but sure. But you were in charge. Yeah, no, no definitely <laughs> not. Um, and do we have, uh, do you get your folks on the, yeah, on the screen? Yeah, okay, Andrew, Andrew Rickert. Uh, and where's our other fella? Andrew's from the CWCB. Um, Who's uh, yeah, Eric, Eric Schermstedt? Yeah. He's from Western Weather Consultants. I don't see anybody else uh, there. He is. Yeah. There there he is. All right. Oh, there's Eric. Good deal. Okay. A four person team to talk about weather modification, which is to say, you know, cloud, cloud seeding. seeding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's only so much you can do with so much water. So you got to start <laughs> making more of it. And, and that's but, what know, these guys have been doing for a while. Okay. All right, well, yeah, All right. It. gentlemen, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Director Ely, for uh, getting uh, arranging this uh, uh, work session with the commissioners. Thank you, commissioners, for having us. Um, we're here today to talk about the Central Colorado Mountain River Basin Weather Modification Program. I'm going to call it CCMRB if I refer to that. And the CCMRB, but a uh, quick introduction again. I'm Mike Itell. I'm a water resource specialist. TK here is our Director of Science and Interstate Matters. And on the, uh, the link is uh, Andrew Rickett from the CWCB, who uh, oversees all the weather modification programs in the state, and our consultant, uh, Eric Germstadt from Western Weather Consultants, that does all the operations and the permits and things like that. And they're going to talk a little bit in the middle of the presentation. I don't have a real detailed presentation. I'm not here to talk a lot of science with you about cloud seeding. A couple years ago, we, uh, DK and a, a whole crew of folks came and gave you the hard, hard science. We're happy to talk about some of that if you have questions. Uh, but quite honestly, today we're here just to talk about the CCMRB program, the partnership, 
uh, and the permit renewal and, and what we're seeking to do in Pitkin County. Um, so with that, I'll just get going here, guys. Uh, today, our meeting objectives are pretty, pretty simple to go over the program. I talk about the, the permit renewal and what that entails. Um, and then we'll, we'll finish up with uh, what the River District is doing as the fiscal manager and uh, managing the program for the next five years. And we, we view cloud seeding really as a, uh, an adaptation to climate change. Uh, it is truly one of the only uh, methods of au true augmentation in the water supply world. It actually you know, creates water from the, I like to use the, uh, we're wringing the clouds, we're kind of squeezing the sponge a little bit, making those clouds more efficient. We're not making water, but we're making more water supply. Uh, generally, uh, for cloud seeding, you have ground-based or air-based. Uh, our CCMRB program is all ground-based, either remotely operated ground-based or ones that are actually you know, ma manually operated by an operator that owns the property and they're leased on there. And we burn a, a mixture of silver iodide, which uses uh, it's a similar uh, organic chemical, uh, hexagonal chemistry. The, the molecular makeup of it is similar to water, so it helps create uh, water molecules out of the snow. And those are just uh, pictures of uh, how we do that around the state. Different, they're a little bit old aircraft. We do have one program in the state that uh, that uses aircraft, and Andrew will talk about that. Uh, but over the overall, the program and uh, three of them in the River District, the CCMRB. You have the Gunnison down in the lower, and then the Grand Mesa, uh, the Mesa, and then the San Juan also has a additional. Uh, Pointer. Pointer, yeah. Yeah, here you go. There you go. Um, no. hit, hit laser. Sorry about that. I'm not the zoom master. There you go. But anyways, yeah, I'll kind of focus it on that. And the CCMRB is really the one we're here to talk about because that's the one that the River District manages. But what I want to talk about is cloud seeding in general. If you look at that inset map as the River District and the cloud seeding uh, uh, target areas within the state and uh, how they represent the upper Colorado River Basin specifically, and we are really um, targeting the Continental Divide and the West Slope, and we're really, you know, hitting uh, the heart of the Colorado River system uh, for the snowpack. And that's really, all those uh, triangles are different uh, generators, they're actual locations. Uh, the green ones are, uh, are manual, the red ones are remotes, and you can see that we have them well targeted, and uh, we're looking to expand the program. Uh, but overall, I wanted to talk about the Colorado River Basin real quick. So the seven states, you can see that this uh, helps helps generate water. Uh, the general rule of thumb is uh, cloud seeding can enhance a water supply by anywhere from 2 to 12 percent. Every storm is different. Not You're not going to get the same effect from every storm. It has to do with winds, uh, moisture, uh, density of the clouds, and all that's taken into, into consideration when we operate the, the program. Uh, but with that, I'll let Andrew Rickard jump in real quick and talk about how the state funds and the partnership, uh, I'll go back real quick. I didn't, I failed to mention the CCMRB partnership is the River District Front Range Water Council, which is pretty much Denver Water, Northern Water, City of Pueblo, uh, Southeastern, all the basic Front Range Water suppliers that we deal with, with the Trans Mountain Diversions. And then there's a component uh, that Andrew will talk about from the Lower Basin. And then we have the Eagle River uh, Watershed, uh, Water and Sanitation District is also a partnership. But Andrew, go ahead and take over, if you don't mind. Yeah, hi, can you guys all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great, yeah, I um, appreciate you having me. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm up in actually Steamboat for Water Congress, had some engagements up here, but um, I saw you guys in person, yeah, like as Mike said a couple years ago with DK, um, happy to be back. Um, you know, cloud seeding's been really catching on lately in Colorado, you know, it, it dates back to 1972, um, but we have seven total programs around the state um, just in 2019, water year 2019-2020, we started the first aerial program targeting the Never Summer Mountain Range up with Jackson Water Conservancy District up by Walden. And actually, they liked the program so much that a few years later, they wanted to permit a ground base. So now they have an aerial and a ground base program. And this year, we're also working with the St. Brain Left Hand Water Conservancy District to start a new cloud seeding program for them as well. So it's really, you know, it's been catching on lately. I think people are starting to see the science behind it and start getting behind this. Um, we're also working with some people up in the Yampa White Green um, doing a feasibility study to see if we can put some generators up there and um, target some areas up there that we think are some, you know, some good hot spots for 
weather modification. But yeah, um, let me just talk about funding for a second. Um, so we get about $350,000 from the state through CWCB's project build. We have local water conservancy districts and ski areas and local partnerships that chip in about 550 to 600,000. And then we get a big portion, the other third from Lower Basin. Um, you can see those four um, entities at the top that we get the money from, but this is just a partnership we have with them. Um, it's been going on for many years now, um, this agreement with these Lower Basin states, because you know they understand the importance of boosting the water supply in the Colorado River. Um, so I just got done submitting my proposal to them. Um, they're gonna be providing $443,000 to the programs this year. And most of that's actually gonna, this year is gonna go to operations, which is very encouraging um, because, you know, we need to run these generators when we can. Um, and finally, I just want to briefly touch on the permitting process that Mike alluded to earlier. Um, we have to, there's, we have to follow the Colorado revised statutes for permitting and um, renewing any weather modification permits around the state. So that's what we're gonna be doing with the CCMRB permit this year. And we wanted to make a couple changes to it with some of the target areas so we can include some, some of the ski areas around you guys. Um, but you know, that's a process where we advertise in papers in all the counties that within the target area and all the adjacent counties providing the public with a notice of intent. And then we schedule a public hearing where you know people can come and voice any concerns or questions. We let them know about the program, um, what we're gonna be doing, and you know just all this stuff we follow. Then I actually write the permit and the record of decision to hopefully have a season start on November 1st through about April 15th. So that's our, our weather modification season. Um, but yeah, I, now I'll pass it off to Eric just to dive a little bit more into the actual CCMRB program. All right, everybody hear me okay? Yep. All right, so like Andrew was saying, um, I guess a few years ago when I came up, um, I, Greg invited us up to come up and, and speak. Um, we, we gave you guys a couple choices of trying to get, obtain your own permit or kind of wait until now when the CCMRB program permit um, came due and maybe you guys would be able to, you know, be included um, within that target area and kind of share the costs with the whole, um, you know, funding group that's associated with the CCMRB versus kind of doing everything on your own. Um, so now we're at that point where, um, you know, we're just looking at including um, Aspen and snow mass into the area and then also kind of you know just going up to the county line um, up into the high country up to where uh, the Gunnison program um, comes in there yeah, there's a lot of really good high country I know the lower basin states and the Colorado River system would be very interested in, in uh, getting some seating in there um, possibly get a little overflow seating from the Gunnison program. And I'm sure the Gunnison people wouldn't mind a little overflow um, into their area as well. Um, but anyways, Pitkin County isn't um, new to cloud seating. It's been going on in, in your area for quite some time. Um, you guys have been um, included in probably the majority of all of the permit hearings that we've held for either Vail, Beaver Creek, or for the CCMRB programs, just due to um, your vicinity to the other counties that are seated in. Um, so I'm pretty sure, you know, that there's been public notices in the Aspen Times every time we put a <laughs> permit together. Um, so this wouldn't be any different for, uh, you know, a lot of people in your area, I'm sure they're used to seeing, um, seeing that. And, there's been a few people in the Aspen area that have attended some of these public hearings that we've we've had, but uh, typically they they aren't overly well attended by the public. Um, there's usually a couple concerned citizens, but by the time uh, the hearing's over with, their questions had been answered, <clears throat> and they're a lot more uh, comfortable with the proceedings that we we showed them that we're going to do. Um, 
So really, you know, our, our goal is to just expand the CCMA program to include the ski resorts. And this just opens up the possibility that down the road, um, maybe we get a ski area coalition put together where we get Vail, Aspen, Snowmass, um, maybe a few other ski areas in the area to all participate just to help, you know, the funding of the whole region and also allow other water users in the Roaring Fork Valley uh, the opportunity if they want to join uh, as a funding partner um, into the program as well. So I, I guess unless there's any other specifics Mike wanted me to go over, I could just throw it back to Mike right now. And we're also, any questions, you feel free to just raise your hand and fire a question, too. Fancy, go ahead. I'd yeah, like have to have a conversation questions. rather than talk at you so much. Well, I like it when you're talking also, but um, a couple of questions. So the silver iodide <clears throat> comes down with the rain, and it's like the germ that the water droplet forms around. Is that correct? So it comes down with the rain and does what <laughs> to the soil and so, the water and everything? That so we what we do is when we, we burn the silver iodide, it vaporizes um, the solution and creates artificial ice nuclei, which the water grows on like a natural snowflake would around a natural ice crystal. And then as it grows and gets heavy enough, the snowflake falls to the ground. And then in the spring, um, when the snow melts, the, the leftover little ice nuclei is basically just an inert piece of dust that's on the ground once it's used up. Okay. To form a silver iodide, and I've, I've looked into this because it's probably one of the first questions out of everybody's mouth when you present to this, and, and uh, you have to kind of um, address that real, real, real straightforward. So, uh, I'm not an organic chemist, uh, but I have a few friends that are organic chemists, and when I tell them that silver iodide and I give them the, the molecular equation, they go, oh, the first thing out of their mouth is, oh, that's an extremely inert uh, in salt. Salt. It's not soluble, it's inert, so it's really. Uh, like he says, once it comes out, it really just does not interact with anything. It's, it just doesn't it doesn't find itself back into the water watershed. It, it binds into the into the soil matrix pretty much. And on that whole process, uh, we're we're interested in, in studying that a little bit more on the snowpack and how that affects things. And we're in the process of working with the Desert Research Institute and Andrews Andrews office to to look at a study and going out and do snowpack sampling after cloud seeding events and and looking for that that isotope in there and being able to put a you know fingerprint to it and and it also that also lends to itself to that that it's actually working and you're producing snow too so it's a it's a double-edged type of uh, study that we're looking but, into but we do drink it I, I mean if you have one up at the head headwaters of the crystal river up with the Gunnison thing our water comes down and you know, or it comes off of Sopris in Nettle Creek for Carbondale, and then we drink the water, and it's got to have those particles in it. And I'm assuming they're fine, and it's not a problem. I'm just curious. No, yeah, so I, I don't think, that from what I understand, that actually it interacts into the into the streams. To be honest with you, I think, like I said, it's not soluble, so it doesn't it doesn't bind to the water molecule at all. And it doesn't run off. It doesn't run off. That's what I say. When it hits that soil, the the the, the, the charges in the soil soil matrix, or you know, the, the isotopes in the there's lots of different things that are charged soils, clays, sands, things like that. It just binds to those nuclei. Uh, but we are we are looking into that directly just to see how it, you know, because it's a common question, and I'd like to know more about it myself. Yeah. So you can speak to it. And my second question is: so the clouds that are coming just, over the Rockies normally go keep moving right across the country, and so. If we wring out all the water in Colorado, how did Kansas and Nebraska feel about that? Uh, the, Andrew's got a good good response to this usually, but they call it the robbing Peter to pay Paul type of method. And, and to be honest with you, from the, the research that I've read, and it, it seems to me that it's not taking anything away from Kansas or anything like that. It's just wringing out a little bit more moisture in the cloud that's already there. It's just not, it's just not in a condition to, to, uh, to coalesce around a snowflake, if you will. Yeah. Um, and can I add to that, Mike? Yes, please. Um, yeah, and you know, they've done so many studies on this in the weather modification community. Um, and just the consistent findings is there's no evidence at all of precipitation decrease. In fact, a lot of the studies find that there's actually a precipitation increase downwind from seeding. So, so if anything, we're helping. 
Okay, that, great. And I just, and going back to the last thing, I just wanted to add that, yeah, the silver iodide is just a naturally occurring element in nature. And, you know, there's been a lot of environmental assessments of cloud seeding operations, and all of them have found like no detectable increase in total silver concentrations above background levels in soil streams or aquatic species in any of the seeded areas. What, what, is the, hard to what is the human health impacts of silver on the human body? Well, it's a heavy metal. Well, it is, you're right. Silver now, is not good, but this is silver iodide. And I was going to say this form of silver iodide is different than the silver, I forget, uh, Eric, you might know the, the molecular well, name of it. Well, you have silver it, oxide, you have silver oh. iodide, you have silver nitrate, you have... That's what I'm saying. It's different than those. Those are very reactive in the environment, whereas silver iodide is not. And, it's and, still got the word But, but silver, you're silver. correct. So there is, there is some silver, you know, I'm sure there is a human health standard. Uh, where I would go with that answer to you, though, is... Our program with the USGS does, well, has been a long-standing water quality program. We sample all throughout the basin, and we, we sample for all types of constituents, and it's not ever been a, been, a, been a hot hit, you know what I mean? It's not something that we're showing a prevalence. Yeah, in but as a, as a nurse, as a parent, um, I have concerns about putting something sure. unnatural into our air, which, and I know you say it binds with the soil, but we have soil runoff into our water systems. So I am, um, and, and that, so I have a definite concern there, and I've always expressed that concern when we've had these discussions. I'm not deviating from my norm. Um, the other thing I believe in, it just happens, is the wind and the clouds know no boundaries. They don't know where the city lines are or the county lines. So if you're seeding around us, we're getting the benefit of the efforts of those around us. And so, yeah, um, and, and for me, um, until there's, I, I just have a health concern about putting something that's not natural into our environment when we are trying to clean up our environment so we have a better quality of life. Greg? Yeah, just, I just wanted to talk about scale. Um, how many tons per year of this stuff are you putting into the atmosphere? Oh. <laughs> Eric, would you it's like not, to? It's, it's not yeah, tons it's, at all. It's, it's, I mean, it's, for a season yeah, when I, we I, order I'm to sure. mix the chemical, we're ordering maybe a hundred pounds total and so that's spread out through the san juan mountains that spread out through all the central mountains that you know when the operations happen um and they do snow sampling when they're looking for these a lot of times they have to use a trace chemical just to find that what was released went where it was said because they're finding this in, in the parts per trillion order. So it, it's not all coming down in one spot. It's being spread over like 800 square miles of area, which, you know, over that amount of area, you get a 2% increase in water content in the snow over a season that that creates a lot of a lot of usable water for downstream users. Um, but as far as back to the question of would you drink it? Yes, I would drink it. I've been drinking it for my entire life. So my dad started this company when I was one years old and has been seeding in the areas that I've lived. And so I, I assume I've drank plenty of it. I ski on it. I ski in it, um, you know, eat snowflakes while it's snowing. So um, I, I'm not concerned about the, the health benefits, but I do understand that other people do have their concerns. And, you know, we're very willing to get any of the research papers to you for any additional information that you'd like. Um, but I, I guess that's, that's what I would have to say is that we're, we're looking at such, you know, small numbers in the snow that it, it, it's not very concerning. If I could just follow up, I, I asked the question a little bit facetiously because I know it's a, it's a small amount. Um, I, I don't know if DK has ever put this together or you have regarding the scale, you know, of the things we put in the atmosphere. I think, I think a fireworks display in Aspen of the many fireworks displays we have here on an annual basis probably puts a multiple fact, you know, hundreds of pounds more of pretty scary chemicals in the atmosphere, yet we, we, we sacrifice that and we drink the water. Um, the pollutants on our highway are probably a million times higher than this, yet we don't question it when it's in our atmosphere. So I'm, I'm, 
it frustrates me because it comes up every time. But I, I think that it's interesting how we're so concerned about this while we ignore things like an entertainment with fireworks display or our own airport or our own highway and the pollutants that are coming from Los Angeles or, you know. Or the adverse effects of wildfire smoke. Or wildfire smoke. You know, all the other, it's just kind of funny that this becomes the, the, the touch point. So I'd love to just, I'd love to just get some understanding of the scale of what's being put into the atmosphere. Well, I, I'm just going to jump in because I think we do pay attention to fireworks. I think we do pay attention to Meg Florida on our highway. I think we do pay attention to those things that we do have some control over. And I think there is a cumulative effect. And I would like to ask anybody who's ever had their blood levels tested for silver, who's in an area where, you know, they they've been have close proximity to silver oxides or silver nitrates or silver iodides that have been you know, exposed to. That's why they took silver out of fillings, because they were found to be toxic to the human body. So I'm just saying, you know, there's only so much we can do to mess with Mother Nature till she bites us in the butt. And I think we need to be careful with that. And if we're getting the benefit of cloud seeding around us, let's continue to monitor it before we jump into the fray and add and contribute mm -hmm. to what could end up being a concern for public health. Commissioner Clapper, I, I appreciate your, your, your <laughs> candor with that. I spent 10 years of no, my life and fighting I, I respect heavy that metal, very much, so. and I, but I will offer to you that I can provide you some literature on the silver iodide and the different oxides, and I would I'd follow up with that report for you. Well, that's, two, that's okay. I this. pretty much became a heavy, heavy metal expert when I dealt with Superfund no, for 10 years. Oh, you already know that already. That's so <laughs> I, yeah. I know a lot about dirt. Is silver iodide a heavy, heavy metal? Silver. Silver is, but not on silver iodide. It's a, there are different compounds, it's just a, like there's different so. compounds of lead or, you know, any any of the heavy metals. They they all come in different shapes and forms. Um, but I can provide you again if you'd like. So, however, but with that, um, I'll continue on here. Um, as far as the program goes, um, we just recently went to the. We were always doing uh, annual cost share agreements with all our partners and operators. And that uh, is a bit laborious, so we uh, asked the River District Board to consider a multi-year uh, fiscal ag arrangement with the cooperators. And uh, at the July board meeting, they gave us authorization to, to manage the program for the next five years. And we're coinciding that with the weather modification permit time frame, so it's all kind of bundled together. Uh, and it also uh, shows the commitment of the partners and, and the River District to, to this program. And with that, we'll, we'll sign a five-year MOA or cost share agreement with the Front Range Water Council and the Eagle River entities and any other partners that would like to, to be a part of the program. Uh, there's a multiple multitude of uh, funding scenarios, but generally we were modeling the program under a number of hours. We'd like to be able to operate. And like I said before, every storm is different, every year is different. Uh, you know, the, the, the long-term drought just seems to be more persistent. Uh, from a water supply perspective, uh, cloud seeding is really a good good program to be involved in. It has multi multitude of states that are involved, again, like we showed. And uh, well, we're targeting about 2,500 hours of cloud seeding generation within the CCMRB program. And it could be on one year, it might be 3,000 hours. On a year that you don't have uh, suitable storms and an extra dry year, you might seed less. And so, you know, and we'll have a basically the funding mechanism for multiple years and we don't have to go out asking each partner every year for a different amount of funding, uh, things like that. So it's really given us some stability in the program and it'll allow us to grow the program in certain areas. Um, if we do, uh, the permit is expanded in the Pitkin County area, most likely we'll be able to bring in a couple different generators depending on where the locations would be. Um, and we talked about the ski areas. Uh, we're in the initial, initial consultations with the ski areas to try and form a new, new coalition uh, to bring in other ski areas to support Vail's uh, efforts. Uh, Vail would like to see other ski areas involved. And we've talked to C Copper Mountain and Arapaho Basin. And Winter Park is actually a, a member of our program. And they have a, they've been a longstanding member. Uh, and they operate their program in Grand County. Um, and so that's that's a, another ski area that's involved. And I believe in the San Juans, the Purgatory Ski Area is a, is a partner down there. Uh, but with that, uh, the River District's, uh, I'll hand it over to DK for some final final discussion, but the River District also is, a, we are a $25,000 a year partner, and we've, uh, they've given us approval to spend up to $50,000 if needed. And so that's where the River District's at. Uh, if other partners are interested, we would be interested in discussing uh, if there is a, a need or a want for a partnership. You know, not too many counties are involved, but there are different mechanisms for funding uh, for different things, whether it's studies of salt, salt 
different things like that. And then Steve, uh, do you have a quick question? A couple of questions. One on the chart that shows the how much per year, and there's one of the bars that says Vale slash BC. What is okay, that? So, so Vale, vale Beaver Creek was actually oh, the first Creek, weather okay. modification permit in the state. They actually helped develop the technology. Uh, in 2000, as you'll see, that, that bar goes to zero. Uh, during COVID, they kind of took a hard line at their budget, and they, they just said, sorry, we're not participating this year. Uh, it was so a are surprise. they so online to participate they, We just had a phone point? call with them last week. Uh, they, they did not say yes. They didn't say no. Uh, they want, they want to develop that ski, ski area coalition pro program. It seems like the ones, at least a couple or the, all three of the the stations in Picking County were actually designed to for the moisture prevail. Yep. You got it. As the target areas, that's where Eric comes in. Depending on which way the wind's blowing, they they decide to turn them on and off depending on where where that permit area is. That's why we want to fill in that western part of Pitkin County just to have a little bit more leeway in our operations, and to to fill an area that we think is would be suitable for for seeding. Uh, you know, again with the water supply effort, there's 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 soil impacts, there's soil moisture impacts. It's going to help increase stream flows, base flows. Uh, soil moisture, you know, I, I think of wildfire when I think of that, that could be uh, impactful for, for preventing or, or lessening the damage of a wildfire. Uh, but DK, you, you haven't said much, and I'm sure you guys have some <laughs> final, final parting words of wisdom. Um, well, I, I hope so, but, you know, basically the message is we're, we're not really asking for, yeah. for anything. We, the, the program is well-funded. We have a lot of support, as you heard, across seven states. Um, there's activities throughout the states, uh, in particular Utah, um, and this is a proven scientific approach to uh, adapt to climate change. And this summer, notwithstanding, you know, it's especially in this county, it's been extremely dry and hot, and that's projected to continue, of course. So all science um, uh, is pointing to a future that's drier and warmer, and we know if we don't do anything, we're not doing our jobs. So for us and the regional water supply, it's absolutely critical um, from our board's perspective um, to pursue this, this pathway. We're here to provide the information. We were here several years ago, as you recall. We brought the scientific experts. We're happy to continue on that side. This is really more of a sort of a informational, how does this work? We want to make sure all your questions are answered. The, the um, notice will be going out uh, in the paper. Um, obviously, you all um, can and should weigh in as, uh, along with the well-informed public. We want the information to get be out there. There's a lot of online resources um, that we want to, to bring and make sure that the issues regarding public health are well understood. Um, these studies um, have been uh, peer-reviewed across multiple disciplines. It's very hard to um, detect uh, in the environment. Um, in fact, um, unless you use the most sophisticated um, instrumentation, you're not going to see it. You're not going to taste it. You're not going to ingest it. And so you heard very well, it's an inorganic, uh, inert compound that really does not interact with the water, the soil, um, and all it does is it brings uh, the efficiency of the cloud to a higher level, the efficiency to convert the moisture that's already naturally occurring and bring it to the ground where it can be used for multiple purposes, recreation, um, you know, water supply. Those are the, the main things that we're after. But as Mike said, we're also seeing elevated temperatures in our streams. Um, this is going to help uh, the base flow conditions and those temperature issues in a warmer, drier future. Um, and so, we, you know, the, from our perspective, it's a win-win. We want, again, to provide the information, um, and we'd love to have the partnership, but we have direction, uh, policy direction to move forward, and we're doing this, again, to engage you all and the public. Um, and we don't want you to be blindsided or surprised by any means, so that's why we're here today. Question, um, just regarding the um, a couple of things. One, first of all, I think the first time I heard about this was in 1972, that's what I was when say. George Stranahan came and presented it to us as school kids. I was 12, 
Um, and he basically said the same exact thing you said back. So it, it's not like it's a new technology. Um, so it has been studied pretty thoroughly. Uh, the other thing is, though, if there's no moisture coming through the weather system uh, above us, it just does. It's not going to. It's not going to solve our problem in the middle of a drought if the weather, if the sky isn't holding any moisture, right? Uh, Correct. We're not cloud seeding ourselves out of a drought. No, we're <laughs> right. not cloud seeding ourselves into a powder day. It's an, an enhancement per storm, you know. It's if there's moisture on, in the air, it's you measured on seasons. It's not measured in storms. I like to say, and it's yeah. something we're doing in the dry years. We're doing it in the wet years because mm -hmm. it's a you just got to do it every year. And we, under certain conditions, we will cease seeding. That's something I didn't mention. There are con uh, stipulations within the permit under certain levels of snowpack when they get certain level high. Obviously, we if don't it's need a big anymore. Year, you're not going to do uh, it. Avalanche dangers are, are a reason to curtail sea seeding when you're getting that bomb cyclone. We will have to stop seeding at those times. So they're written into the permit. Uh, but it is, again, it's something that we're doing every year. And it's been going on. That's the other thing for a lot of folks is they don't realize the depth. And when I got exposed to this a couple of years ago with DK, I was, I'll have to be honest with you, when I found out how big it is in the, the Northwest and around the world, quite honestly, I was surprised at the, the technology used. Uh, globally. Okay, go we got a Kelly and then Steve, yeah, and then Kelly. we got a wrap. Commissioner we Curry got has been, been very okay. patient. Okay. Just, just so you know, because we've got our next people yep. sure. lined yeah. up here in the room. So. Um, just two questions, please. What budget does this come out of at the River District is the first question. And then the second question, when you meant, you said a partnership would be great, but I'm not sure what a partnership with Pickett County looks like in this program. So. Um, I'll tackle some of that and maybe we can tag team that. Um, as far as the River District, uh, this is in the general fund currently, uh, and it's paid out of that on an annual, and we're again, we're 50, 50,000 of the annual budget, the majority of it coming from, from Andrews, Andrews Group in the Lower Basin, and then the Front Range Water Council is about a third, we're up right in that range. And then the last question was? Um, partnership. You had said what is, you know, we'd love to be in partnership, but I'm wondering what does a partnership look like? You know, um, it's something we'd be happy to discuss yeah. further with you. Um, you know, I've thought of the Healthy Rivers Fund. Is it a letter fund, of endorsement? Like is it a presentation of the Healthy Rivers Fund? It could it be all of it? <laughs> yeah. You know, or financial contributions. We were more than happy to add to the, you know, if there's an interest in studies, things like that. Because we're con that's another thing that we do is we're constantly trying to stay up with the technology and science. We want to initiate studies that are appropriate and, and, and lend to the, the knowledge base for, for cloud seeding. Yeah. I mean, I'm supportive of the project. I would um, probably want the Healthy River Board to make a recommendation to us um, at any further level. Of but that was the yeah. we and just the board, that If up. this board chooses to go in that direction, I think we need to run it through our public health department. So, Stephen, then Francine, then we do have to wrap. Yeah, so, great. so, thank you guys for being here. You're talking about Western Picking County and looking at the map, the only place it seems like along the crystal river valley would be the only place that you'd have an accessible by road kind of locations is do you have locations picked out and how many would you want to do in picking county well there's uh, one right sorts up the of pass here on private property up in yeah. um and that's Mountain the consultants Valley. generally take care of the, the land. We find that uh, private land is a lot easier to put on than public land. It uh, can be done on public land. Uh, it's a little bit more of a hoop, but we have a le lease with each person. Uh, we would look into that, I think, in, in the fall. We'd start really, really narrowing down the target areas and, and look at wind speeds, wind directions, things like that, and how to do it. And I think there's actually one already positioned that when the winds are right, favorable, it could seed already into this area. And then with uh, Andrew's funding, hopefully, if it keeps coming like it has been from the lower base and we'll be able to buy remotes and the remotes allow us to put them in, in a little bit deeper into the you know they still have to have access to them but you don't have to be able to drive right up to them in the winter because they're all done by satellite and uh, wi-fi or cellular uh, remotes okay Francie, and then yeah well i just read an article on silver toxicity and um, um what it does when it comes through seeding efforts and it was pretty convincing as were you guys so um i'm on board and i'd be happy to work with if anybody who's interested in figuring out some way we can create a partnership that makes this easier for you guys that'd be great well, i still want public health to evaluate it because it is a public health issue we're already mm -hmm. talking about microplastics in our snowpack so now um you know we're going to add one more thing to our snowpack and i'm you know as much as i know we have water issues and as much as we have a concern i'm just uh, public health comes first for me at this point so right. enough 
Thanks for that, coming. I appreciate your all's time today. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Director Thank Eagle. you. Always thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was great. Mm -hmm. See you, Dave. Take care. Next. Did you get your question? You guys look so casual yeah, for how credentialed know. you are. <laughs> I know. All right, Gary, do you guys want to come up? We got up dressed together we today. Right 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Oh, he just checked out. Maybe not. Thanks, Craig. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Gary. I just want to pull up the slides to give you guys a reminder, a reminder of what we talked about last December. <laughs> I've had oh some glorious days on North Star this year. Yes. We need to talk about it's been so well, while she's bringing it up, I can give you kind of uh, uh, interesting this year. North Star was less busy. Yeah. The numbers are down. Um, they were down, not massively, but they were down from last year. And it didn't always, and, and we actually had water. So it wasn't like, you know, it was a water thing. It was just, you know, we're enforcing the parking a lot more than we've ever had. And um, I think this year, what we're seeing through all of our trail counters is a flattening, kind of a flattening out of use. We did not see that massive increase that we have seen the last two years, which is a good thing. We have North Star had a decrease, but other places kind of went like this, but mostly, mostly flat. So um, hopefully that's the future. We still have rec capacity issues around the county, but at least we're not in 20%, 30%, 40% upticks every single year. Do you so, think the, would the, did the beavers have anything to do with that? You know, the beavers could have. It really, you know, it, it, we don't know because we, you know, obviously people still used it and it was still a, a, a decent amount of use. Now, did the beavers actually, you know, we tried to get the word out about the beaver dams and that we were not going to allow the beaver dams to be dismantled. Amazingly, this year we didn't have a, um, a runoff that knocked out the dams. Um, I went through the beaver dam um, with my paddleboard and my FaceTime doesn't work anymore because I went in. <laughs> I was like, shoot, poof. And I'm like, but there was a way people could paddle around it. So it worked. So maybe that did. I don't know. I, I'm, I, I would be surprised. It inhibits, it inhibits some people. They, it limits they, some yeah, people. Right definitely some some families might have chosen not to do it because they were a little concerned. People who aren't used to being on the river, they could be a little concerned. But I can't imagine the majority of users would have a big issue. But maybe it did. We'll it see. I took rain. Aloysius over it while he was asleep. Ah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's great. Maybe it was the rain and they didn't want to get wet. I, you know, in the years past, we always had rain and uh, a lot of rain though this year. So okay, let's know. go to anyway, parking. But to get back to this point, what well, we're here today and why we're here early is because um, we always told you back in December we went through this whole um, presentation. Jesse will give you kind of a quick update in a minute. But what we're looking for today is kind of a thumbs up to keep moving forward with this because we have a contractor that can actually get a decent amount done this fall. And that would be significantly helpful so we don't have to bring it into next spring, wait for snow melt, and so we can definitely have this, most of this or all of this in place before peak season next year. So nothing's really changed with the project since, but, and, and the reason why we didn't give you a budget number last year is because we didn't know one and I'm happy we didn't because budget numbers have been ridiculous and crazy. I think we've got a pretty good budget number now. What's in your packet is about 1.29. Um, we are working with the contractor on a final number, including construction management and everything else. I have a feeling it's gonna be about 50,000 more than this number. And we can talk about the North Lot. We put an alternative in here to potentially reduce numbers. Uh, we will have the final number for you during the budget supplemental process. Um, so, but I'm thinking right now it's about $50,000 higher than this. And so the goal today is to see if you give us a thumbs up to move forward. So we start getting this under contract and that we can start <clears throat> getting this, these improvements done. And so that's the main goal of today. Um, and then we can talk about North, um, the North lot 
do we want to because on the north lot we did have a split open space board on it some felt that you know this one could be delayed or potentially we do a little less on it now and we see what the rest of them do and we could do more in the future um, or just don't do anything with the north lot and save between 150 140 150,000 you know staff is always wary of not including it because we usually always come back and do it in the future years but um, so we've been looking at it staff wise thinking if you don't want to include North Star and you want to save some money you know at least pave North the North lot while we have a paving contractor out there and then we can add the you know the the other amenities do the tree work most of the bigger tree work and potentially do other things in the future and so Jesse will go through which of the lots the other three lots um, you know that was a priority all along is to deal with the parking issues that we have today make the parking areas safer and easier to ingress and egress and so um, you know the open space board was fully on board with moving this forward 100% unanimous the North Star lot was kind of our sticking point so today if I can just have Jesse go just quickly through it um, and then we can come back to if you guys are good with it and then we can come back to what we do with the North lot that good yep good Perfect. just to kind of orient you all to um, the different areas that we're talking about and how they relate to the river is the first as you come going out of town toward the Wildwood put in, you hit the pedestrian bridge and takeout, which is one area for improvement. Then the north lot, the beach access, which right now there's no formalized parking there at all. And then the south gate, which is kind of our primary main <coughs> spot that has a lot of space to accommodate cars and um, is, yeah, where we, where we push people when the Wildwood area isn't an option because of low flows and stuff like that. So that's um, definitely gets a lot of use there. Um, so just to jog your memory, the takeout is an area that has always kind of given everybody a headache <laughs> as you try to pass through there. And cars used to park here. We've definitely gotten that more under control with just our um, enforcement things. But there's still opportunity here to make it really a safer place. So we've kind of looked at improvements that Gary mentioned kind of creating one entry and one exit that would be divided by a, what's called a valley pan, which is a little catchment area and depression, and then a curb along the parking side. Um, and then this would be still like it is today, a, a formalized 15 minute loading zone. People come in, they put their paddle boards on. I saw it working beautifully this morning. You know, um, it, when it works, it works. And when people start to park there and clog it up, it doesn't. Um, but this would take out one of the big trees there. Um, the other problem that we're trying to address with these improvements is improving the ADA um, accessibility of the East of Aspen Trail, where it currently kind of drops really steeply down. We're going to kind of elevate the trail to meet partway with the where the parking is and kind of have a little wall to bring that elevation up, and then another step up will be the parking area. Um, and so we're just creating as much space as we can without encroaching into the preserve there. Um, so this one I think is really important and I think will go a long way to improving uh, the safety and usability of this area. Uh, any questions on the takeout? What are the red X's? The red, oh, tree removal. Tree removal, yeah. And is this the takeout where the bridge is? Yes, right this where the is, is the bridge right here is where you come in. So we'll, st we'll still have the takeout with that little steep walk up thing and then when it gets up past that first gray strip, what is that? That looks like the bike path? Is this that is the bike? bike path here. Okay. So in order to lessen the grade where it comes off of the bridge, we're kind of elevating the level of the bike path. Oh, oh um, that's where. Oh, okay, I get it. Thanks. On the riverside right here. Oh, so here. these kind of a little bol short boulder. I mean, it's not a high wall. It's just some boulders to kind of make an embankment there so that we can fill to even out the yeah. the level of the path so you don't have to dive down and back up. It just yeah, kind of sense. will mellow it out, which I think will go a long way to 
making it more user friendly. And then each of the sites kind of has a paddleboard rack and bike racks so that we can continue to encourage alternate modes and then kind of clean up the site so while people are going to get their car they can stash their boards not on the trail <laughs> which oh, happens cool. a lot um, so those kind of amenities which I think will help organize things a little bit and why are those three trees those excess why are those being removed there by a site or something because they're definitely not intruding into the it's all sight lines person. sight lines and those could be just limbed this was a preliminary one I don't think those ended up I think we're just limbing those the, the one in the middle, there's one big tree. Is, yeah. big if you go back to that they? picture of the, there's only one big tree coming down, and it's in it's that one. Yeah. It's not doing all that well anyway. But those other trees are just going to be limbed, the, the tall ones behind it. So you yeah. can see it again. Yeah, the tall ones yeah. behind it are going to be just limbed. CDOT, you know, at the time we were working with CDOT on all this, and they are like, you take them all out for sight lines, and then we're like, how about if we just limb them up? <laughs> and and go it, back to that picture, would mm -hmm. you please? So the cars parked in that picture, those are not allowed to park there anymore, correct? That's that doesn't what, happen anymore. Correct. Right. This and year has been a huge. We have not huge, heard from that neighbor. I have not heard. Anything. No, I mean this yeah. year has been a huge difference. Um, yeah. You know, um, we've been ticketing, and once the ticket started to go, um, it, it is amazing to see. This year, it's been a huge change. We don't have that. Every once in a while, someone will park there, do a quick run across, and we don't want that either, but there, we are not getting full-on parking there anymore. And it's definitely been safer. And if we do this improvement and keep the parking, it can definitely, it, the safety will be big because we're still getting, you know, people with big vans and big trucks and stuff clogging this and croaching over that white line. You mean like commercial operations? No, the commercials are pretty good. Um, the commercial is not our main issue. They know if they do something wrong, they can lose their license. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's just people. I mean, it's just, I mean. <laughs> With those big van things, that yeah. they, those tall things that everybody's yeah. driving in. Yep. It's, it yeah, it seems like, it's like such a tight area. It's always been such a constrained area. And I'm just wondering how you're going to make all these improvements fit. How far out are you going toward, say, the meadow or the signs or the, you know, I could, I could see elevating the bike path. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out how is this going to work and will there actually be room for people to pull in? Um, it seems so tight, especially when you're building a curb and a, uh, what do you call the bathtub? Yeah, thing? the valley pan. The valley pan. Yeah, no, it, this is a tight spot, but we're kind of, where this fence line is, we have a little bit of space to kind of push it toward the river there. Yeah. Um, and then kind of bring this wall, the little wall that I described to bring up the trail will kind of happen here. So will the trail start elevating on that south end down on that, that direction? It'll, it'll, the grade will start coming up at a more gradual yeah. level. Great. So that that, that is right like now, the danger spot. Yeah. And the sight lines, especially with the tree here, uh, impact the trail sight lines as well as the vehicular oh, sure. sight lines. So removing that tree actually helps, helps a lot because <laughs> it gives bikes. us more room to build walls between the parking and the the trail down below and so you can i mean that's part of the big cost of these things is the walls and the and this is the most the, expensive part of the whole thing is like is that right yeah this is a pricey one because yeah. of the walls and that sort right of thing. but people coming to pick up <clears throat> will have to be coming from say upper parking higher up so they're going to be turning around to get into this, or they're going to be coming in as a straight shot, cutting, cutting over the yeah. double so yellow? Question. Yeah, you'll come in. If you're coming down here, Patty, you'll come around and I make mean, a turn yeah. to go in that way. And, and then, then make they, another turn around to go back into town. And you'll have yeah. more room without that tree in a wall. There's going to be more room to make that turn. That's one thing that we really, that's the engineers figured out. Is there any way to squeak a little bit more room out on the other side of the road just so there's more it seems like you had to hang a big u right there it's pretty narrow and then go back up and then hang a u again on, oh, on this side you're talking yeah about? i thinking what can that be widened at all and also the other thing is you think people are going to be tempted to come in from the wrong direction on this but i was saying they're going to just zip like in patties, straight yeah. down there's going to be signage i don't i think it should function well with the signage and it'll be clear which way people are supposed to enter and leave. Seems like it'd be better for them to come in 
this way and, and go, go out and that go way. Out. Less of a sight line. This way and have to pull another Yui. If you, but we can if, always if reconfigure you use that. that be right. Easy. But one of the things is if to go out the other way, you have less of a sight line to make a left because you're near those trees in that bank there. You know, if we, we really so would like to keep trees. those trees, yeah, the lower trees to your left. Yeah, it's yeah. terrifying pulling out of there. <laughs> right, so it would be, you know, I, the good be, good thing is if we'll, we'll reevaluate this yeah, once. That would be an easy get, change. It just yeah. And we can easily look at if the people aren't having enough, because no one's parking on the other side, we might have room to, to be able to make more of a turn area. The other thing I was going to say on that, the, on the north end, the trees on that side have the tree swing, the, you know, the rope swing. You're not going to limb the rope swing limb, are you? Yeah. We're limbing on the roadside, okay. not the riverside. Make, yeah, okay. Just, I think it make, would make sense to thin those, <laughs> but if you take out the rope swing, boy, that'll be a I tragedy. wouldn't dare touch the rope swing. <laughs> no, that's outside of our limit of disturbance, Greg. <laughs> and that's on, a, <laughs> that's on a different easement, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's on CDOT. I mean, the reality is there's a private land that comes there, and CDOT's right away is there, and we're just going to leave the rope swing alone. My dog used to love jumping off that bridge. And, oh, God, it was so Well, we now made it, um, even Far. though we don't technically want people jumping off it, we redid the, I mean, if you guys went out there, we redid all of the railings. I saw, saw that. that. Yeah. So My dog would find a what way. What if you just fell off that <laughs> accidentally? Like. Yeah. Okay. Going, woo-hoo, yeah. While going, <laughs> going, oh, my gosh, Steve, please. So I am confused by the names of the parking areas. Uh, you have the north parking area, which to me means the farthest north one, which is this one. Is this the one that you were proposing to possibly not do? No. no. The, so this what, isn't parking. This is just a unloading spot. So the north lot slash wildlife viewing platform is the, the next The wildlife viewing park. area? Because yeah. mm-hmm. you have a map, but it doesn't say north parking area. It's go it through says all of them with it. wildlife viewing area parking so that's what the north one is that you yeah. might not do yeah. well because those are the you know it, it's kind of funny because those names just stuck from the original management plan so we mm-hmm. kind of like instead of trying to change them we just kind of let them go through and so um yes this might not be this is kind of the most north place but no one's parking here okay let's this go. is the north lot that's yeah let's go to the next lot yeah. okay so that's a current that's situation wildlife viewing yeah, there's a cool, the we, a long time ago, um, the year I started in 2002, we built kind of a platform out there with a telescope. On, um, the, with, on the riverside. On the river. riverside. So you can walk so you out can there. You see the birds and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, and you can go. So there's a wildlife. Just, oh, yeah, area. I think I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. Just beyond the trees. It's yeah. not by the river. Yeah. And this yeah, is no. where people park for uh, Nordic skiing, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's no river access from this lot, but it's just a short walk down to get to the takeout. Um so you can park here and go down there. And so you could park there and do what? And then go down and get, say that again? It's just a short walk from here down to the takeout that we just looked at. Because so you can't park at the takeout. You this There are three park. If you go to the bigger map. I mean, so if the takeout is full, you could park there and go. You can't park at the takeout. You can't park at the takeout, but there's but two pullouts yeah. past the takeout. If those are full, you go to the north lot. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's point, it's a third of a mile to to this. So what we're seeing now, because we took the parking out on the other side, is this north lot actually is getting used more. Um, people are putting their car there because, you know, really it doesn't take somebody much to walk down there, grab the car, come back, grab your paddle boards, and be on your way. Okay. So. All right. So going to the north lot. North lot. So the north lot is a little bit different than the rest of these that are more kind of highway pull-offs because it does have room and in its existing configuration for cars to back in and pull out without going into the highway and then has what you see here is a couple of parallel spots where we see often kind of larger rvs or larger trucks kind of pull off there when to access the preserve or the trail Um, and then like gary said this is our primary one of our primary um, winter spots to access the North Nordic skiing. So plowing operations and stuff like that are also important considerations here. Um, but this slot to kind of stay consistent with the rest of the plans or the other areas does propose kind of a similar configuration with the um, valley pan and the curb to kind of keep people flowing 
um, in, w in one way and out the other, and then adds a ADA access um, accessible spot that would le lead down to the trail and then a couple of extra spots, but it it's not huge gains as far as parking capacity goes. Um, so that's kind of the North Lot improvements. So if, you got, if we're on this, this, this is where the Open Space Board, you know, when they saw that they could save some money, some of them felt like, you know, it's a lot that works, it's a primitive lot that works, um, let's leave it. And some of them were like, let's, let's just do it because I have a feeling we're going to do it in the future. And while we have a contractor out there, let's get them all done mm -hmm. at once. And it's, it, is a, it is a savings. It's, 100 and, it's probably about 100 and if you don't do anything to this lot, it's about $168,000 of savings, about. I know sure, we haven't finalized that. We have them do it at the same time. Well, it, the savings it, comes from having them do it at the same time. No, the savings comes if we don't do anything to this lot. If we do the other three lots and we take this one out of the contract, we'll save $168,000. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's what you can do right now is, is just leave this lot the way it is. Let's see how the other lots work. And, um, you know, we just know we've done this before with you guys about alternative analysis. And most of the time, not all of the time, we come back and go, okay, mm -hmm. let's do it. And now it's $220,000 instead of $168,000. So we could do a little bit of work here and do some limited tree removals to make it better sight lines um, and, and repave this area and just call it good. That will save some money um, or do the whole thing at once. Um, it's really, since the Open Space Board was split, they were like, oh, let the BOCC decide. And so <laughs> we're coming to you guys to make that decision. Staff is, we're, we're, we, we can see this lot working the way it is today without any improvements. Mm. Or we would like to, you know, we'd like to do the limited piece because I know we're going to have to repave this in the next, you know, within five years. So we have a paving contractor. If we could just pave it and uh, do some limited tree removals, you know, kind of, kind of call that good. So there's th kind of three options to do a limited amount of work, no work, or the full amount. So, you know, while we're on it, this is the big choice that you guys have, and uh, it's it's where um, you guys make a decision. So then, would it be plowed during the Nordic ski season? It's automatically both ways. It's plowed. Plowed. Yeah. No. This this is working for Nordic now. Um, this is just a way to gain some more spots because um, we just see more people using it because we're not allowing parking in other places. So, you know, this is a way to gain some extra parking. Um, but this one is one of those where it is a parking lot now. It kind of works. But we're, you know, we know we'll come back to you at some time for a repaving. And we could come back at that time for a valley pan and stuff. It, it's it's hard. Just ask yeah, I'm never going to move to the next parking lot. Um, no. Questions would be: Can we go back to the photo of it? So, so is this that was paved at some point? Like yes. I didn't even, I don't even think of it as paved. It's actually it is. paved. It is paved. I think CDOT just over the years has been just throwing through some extra over. stuff. Well, they did. Um, it was about ten years ago. Now they were repaving parts of the Highway 82, and they're like, oh, we'll just put it in there, and like. They just did their extra right in there. Extra there. Okay. But it wasn't, they didn't grade it out. They didn't right. do anything. They just paved it. I've, I've got to say that my biggest concern about it is we, we changed the, the look of it from kind of the wild, messy vitality look we all talk about and appreciate about the wildness and turn it into a parkway sort of thing with that looks manicured or a national you know, park look. National park look or something like that. And that's my biggest worry. Um, I certainly app would approve of, you can squeak another parking spot out, you can, some sight lines. Um, if it's been paved, I'd, I was just thinking it was a mud lot all these years in the winter because it always seems so muddy. Um, uh, so my inclination would be let's don't do anything um, because I'm concerned about it becoming more attractive, actually creating more traffic to it because it looks like it's an attraction. And right now it just looks like 
you know, parking off the shoulder and people might drive by and not even know what it is. If it's all buffed out, they're going to say, oh, what's this? Let's it is stop. an attraction. It has a little viewing area. But you stuff. can't tell from the highway. Well, you know, are you, you trying to discourage people from taking advantage of open I'm spaces and amenities? I'm trying not to encourage them from hitting a really heavily used area even more <laughs> is my concern. See, so you guys are dealing exactly okay. the same uh, thing. Well, okay, the wait, Open wait, Space wait, Board wait, had wait. the exact same. I'm going to bring anyway, the board was, back. That's my this is our concern. first discussion. It's going to come back to us again. This is okay. I don't mind the discussion. I just want the board to know we're probably going to be running this this day over till 530 to get the rest of the agenda in. So Okay, let's do it. Well, okay. and one thing you guys can do is you could give us the thumbs up at the end to do everything but this, and we'll come back with this because this is not something that is going to be done first it's the other thing so you do don't have to make a final decision but it is a decision you'll have to make next right. month my, my comment about the aesthetics applies to everything but I do see a total need for it at the takeout so that's the tough thing how do you make the improvements without creating you know, you know what I mean. So it doesn't look like a golf course or. Um, well, the good thing I is. I know exactly what you mean. Since I live above the parking lot at Prince Creek. Right. I know exactly go. what you mean. <laughs> this one we are not. This is, so if you look at this picture, there's some trees to the left that, you know, kind of kill the sidelines. They're in poor shape anyway. Those, w I would say, would go no matter what because we want to improve the sidelines even for the people using the lot the way it is. Um, there's. Next to that white truck, which is one of our ranger trucks, there are two trees there that are in better shape, but would be coming down to create more parking. So, you know, there there are options here to, you know, because we do want people to use it because it is a wildlife viewing area, and we do want people parking here instead of trying to find random illegal places to park. So we are trying to get some people to park here. And we tried very hard not, we're not trying to change this area all that much. So, and we took the open space board out here and I thought they were all good because we showed them what we were taking out and they were like, oh, that's nothing. And so when we, we and so when it, but it, when it came back, I think they were like, ah, oh, we could save some money and maybe we don't want to knock down any of those trees. Uh, maybe not, I'm not so concerned about saving money. I kind of see Greg's point of, mm -hmm. it's very, you know, it's one of those messy Vitelli rural areas. So, Rusty. Steve, and then we're going to go to the next parking lot. So, if you do the paving, you're gaining what? Two extra spaces from what is there now, or what? Yeah. I think um, three. three. Maybe and three. One of them is ADA compliant. Right. We're getting three spaces and an ADA compliant area. So, I think it at least do whatever you have to to gain those extra spaces now because we need the parking now I think and we should do it even if it's doing the, the full thing to gain the extra three spaces I think is important because we want to get people to quit parking on the shoulder of the highway various locations okay let's move that was the original that. intent <laughs> mm -hmm. So We've got two more parking lots to go. Well, the, the other two parking lots, you guys already looked at. There's no change there. Oh, yeah. That doesn't so, mean we're not going to discuss them. <laughs> well, you can discuss them. I just don't. It, there's, there's not a huge change. This is the one where, you know, the Open Space Board was fully supportive of doing all the other three. This one was the issue. So the other two were just kind of an update of what we're doing. And their issue and was cost. mainly the dollar issue, not so much that this doesn't need to be done. It's just... Maybe we can. Well, no, they they were on Greg's. Yeah, they Greg's. they it was both. They were yeah, on okay. Greg's world and 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 <laughs> and and then stat, like Steve's <laughs> world. Well, space, you had two worlds. You had the that let's get scary. more parking, let's do Greg's it right, <clears throat> or you had let's keep it more primitive with less parking. So either way, you're not. It's going to look a little different. It's not a full scale tree removal here. This okay. is not a full scale destruction of this area. Okay, it's Francie not gonna, has a question. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I think that whole stretch of road from the takeout to Twin Lakes has a lot of trees <laughs> and uh, a lot of wilderness and a lot of cars trying to park illegally and trying to figure out how to use the space. So I would be in support of doing it now. And I know that the budget at Open Space and Trails can handle it. Um, and having complained endlessly about the 
parking lot below my place on Prince Creek this year, like you said it would be, is, or you know, when May turns to June, is way better. There's only been two days this whole year where there have been cars on the road, parked on the road. So I do think it solved a problem for the people up at Handy Drive, and I think this would solve a problem. Um, I mean, think about the top of the pass. So, like, you can't imagine more this invasion in the wilderness than the top of the pass. So this is nothing compared to that. So I don't know. I think it's, I, I'd go for it. That would be my choice. Okay, so there's two and one. Kelly, do you have a preference? Um, I, would, I would support very limited improvements there, repaving. <laughs> Well, these making it, an so, ADA spot. <laughs> so if they repay, the they need to boat. do this. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what you said. Yeah. But if they pave, they'd have to put in their little dippy. And no, no, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do the valley pan. This paving would be just paving the asphalt that's there with with new with new asphalt, and so and then no putting signs, in the no ADA, pan. moving the. Yeah, you wouldn't trees. do the pan. You would just pave the lot. It would just be a normal maintenance thing. Um, I would say, if you're going to do that, I mean, it, 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 Francie is correct. The open space program can handle this budget. So, you know, this, this is a large cost no matter what. So adding, you know, the paving back and, and doing some limited tree removal, I don't, I don't think it's going to, it's not going to change the area so dramatically. Um, and we try to remind the two board members that were on our site visit who looked at it, who saw what trees were coming down going, you guys were there. It's not going to change it dramatically. It's just going to, it's just going to improve the parking overall. What, so what about the little whoop de doo and the curb? How's that going to affect plowing? Well, that's what, like our maintenance guys, like, yeah, for this lot, we can work with the curb and gutter, but it'd be preferable from a plowing perspective not to have that. I, I would go with minor improvements, tree removal, the ADA, let's let's put in some parking places there, not put in the curb and gutter, um, just because that gives it too much of a urban. Okay. That I think that, that would be the compromise. That, that makes sense to me. I'm okay with that. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, next parking lot. Yes. Yay. The beach. We're going we'll to the beach. We'll bring that back at I noticed there's the a rain umbrella on there at the beach. I said, look, she's already, it's a sun umbrella. Can I get some clarity on that, though? Does that mean the improvements where the oversized lot vehicle parking is in terms of yeah. how this board is imp interpreting that? or just for the oversized vehicle parking. What I'm interpreting from your image is that that is more of a clear carve out rather than just sort of a side of the road parking. Um, if you go, go back to the photo, it? you'll see that it's kind of, there's already- It's pushing I'm, those cars, it's I'm pushing those cars a little bit further off the highway. So mm -hmm. there's more clear zone. And especially those are smaller cars when they're bigger cars. It's just getting them further away from the, so it's, and those trees right there are all just little scrubs, scrub stuff. So it would just be kind of limbing up what we can limb up, taking out, and we'd just be pushing it a little bit um, That improves internal. your line of sight too. Right, and it gives just better sight lines and everything else as you're pulling out. And so removing that valley pan um, really keeps that lot looking extremely similar to this. It's just going to have new pavement and a little push and a couple trees removed right where that white truck is and those for sightline over there. So Yeah, I would include in what I threw out there also improving those big vehicles because they're going to have them and that would be an, a sight issue for me for people now pulling out and trying to go down valley. Maybe pull the, do the tree removal in a graduated way so you don't find yourself overdoing it wishing you yeah. hadn't. Yeah. Easier to leave them there than take them out. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, let's we'll see. We can we can go back and at your next one we'll have a we'll have a full cost of what this new idea is and kind of a plan showing you what what that entails. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the beach. We're going to the beach. Going to the beach. So this one is just evolved organically over time. Um, the beach access goes down right here, and technically there's no. There's not supposed to be people putting in and taking out here because we wanted it to be more of a area that people can go and enjoy the beach and not be dealing with paddle boards coming this in and out. This is not the Wildwood this is no. parking lot. No, this is place. No, 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 no. still down valley from that. 
Um, but as you see here, kind of there's a big drop in um, rough pavement where it goes from the asphalt to the gravel surface. Um, that always makes me nervous going in and out of there. But um, mm. so this plan kind of builds up a little bit of a wall with grading and adding some fill mm. in this area to create more of a platform for the parking and would add the angled parking, but keep it limited so it doesn't sprawl up and down the highway, which it does now. I mean, I was just driving out there this morning with Comdev and it, you see cars just keeping Going they keep on going the down valley. I mean, this summer, the Rangers um, counted 21 vehicles on the side of the road there. And, the beach. and that's why you see any any of the grass is gone there. But the grass is all smooth brome kind of pasture grass. So this grass. wouldn't be paved, it'd just be gravel? This, this is would gravel. be gravel, We're talking yeah. about on the right side as we're looking Correct. at that photograph. But right. this, this was a, a, would accommodate more cars because it'll be diagonal, but it's not going to inhibit cars from sprawling down the road, will it? Yes. It, it will, will because so you'll have we no can parking or yep. signs, signs. We should put some fences. You'll have maybe lines or something? There's gonna be, you know, what we're if you go back to the plan. But it's gonna be gravel. Yeah. So you're you're gonna see a gravel path. It's gonna be defined. So um, it's once your... it's defined, anybody who parks just like on the other side of the road by the takeout, um, we're gonna tag them. And because we're trying to say, hey, right now you know, 22 cars here is not acceptable, but we're providing parking, stay in those spots. Do not keep going down the highway. Well, okay, we, so when those spots are full, the beach is closed. No, you can't have park a, and go. You can go, you can go to the north lot and walk, there, and walk, walk down. Yeah, you, you can go to the south gate and walk or bike down, north lot, walk or bike down. We're trying to get, because what happens now is that people are parking off basically on the highway because yeah. as they keep going down and down and down the road um, but once this is defined this is going to be the parking and we're not going to allow the parking to go further how, how are you going to not allow it well they'll put signage up and the signage will be pretty clear of what it is and the in the in and out is going to be really clear and uh so we're you know, if we need to fence and if we need to do yeah. more, if we're reducing and we're going to enforce. Reducing the parking from 18 or from 22 to 14, you know, 22 on the Well, 22 day. does not fit comfortably at all now. Right. I mean, yeah. people I'm just park all down the highway. I'm, kind of, I'm not so. just wondering how well this will inhibit that. It's, and I'm, I'm, my other concern is, once again, you've got the pan and the one way, and it formalizes it in a way. It, is there any way you could do this without the pan and the one way and still create the effect? Not, CDOT will not allow, the way that CDOT, CDOT will, because it's not an existing area, we're not just doing maintenance like the north lot. This is a brand new lot, and so CDOT is pretty um, adamant about not having people back out onto that highway. And that's what they're really concerned about, is people backing out onto that highway, and so, creating that delineation between the highway and so you need the parking diagonal. areas. We need, we need, well, you can do, you know, di you could do parallel, but you just get less spaces. And so when the, when you guys looked at this in December, you guys all were like, let's do the diagonal because you get more. And I, you know, the reality is 14 cars is pretty good. And it is 16. This is a previous oh, one. Oh, so it's 16. I think we heard from before, like, let's make, get what we can in there. So it is 16, and I apologize. I just used these rather than the construction documents because it's a little bit more clear. You need to put in some parking. Mini Coopers instead of the SUVs, and they'll <laughs> fit in there. Are we going to put in a um, <laughs> handicap, an ADA? Not at this site, at Southgate in the north lot. This one has too big of a drop off to the beach, I and know, the beach doesn't have a handicap access to the beach and so you can get it, to the trail but you can't get past yeah but it was, this is pretty steep that's Patty. pretty steep too stairs to yeah. get down because it just drops so it's really if we wanted to do ada access here it would significantly change um everything and so um at the time when we got it we were like we have ada access and so many other points that this good. would not be the it one is pretty place steep. It's it. it's pretty good. But slide. you can have ADA access at Penny. There's no ADA no. access. No, oh, phew. Somebody said that to me Sunday night, and I was like, "What? How's that going to happen?" Okay, great. This yeah. would probably be the highest. It's demand a really for rough ADA, ride. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> well, no, a lot of people like ADA access to the trail. 
<laughs> they don't necessarily want to. The beach is really difficult. We're trying to keep the beach a very natural way to get to the beach because if we change right. that to keep ADA access, we, ha we have to harden that whole thing. And it doesn't have to be paved, but we have to make sure that we hit it. And so that was not something that we talked about. Like the public was not, that wasn't the big public process push, but getting access to the trail was. And especially, you know, um, so the north lot with the improvements will have an ADA access. Uh, can, can, at some point, we'll, at the next go around, will we be able to see what the signage will actually look like and the one way, you know, I'm, I'm just worried. It's pretty We're, standard. Yeah, big, um, big red signs on each side of the yeah. entrance. We, we have to go with CDOT. Yeah. And what's the gray around the riverside of the parking lot? This, this is that, uh, it's a rock boulder wall. So to- It's a low wall. To keep a low, yeah, it's like- So to raise the parking feet. area. Because yeah. right now, if you look here, Francie, it just kind of drop. drops. It's hard to see with the uh -huh. grass, but it just drops. So we build up a little bit of a boulder wall to kind of make that parking platform. Okay. And it also makes the parking more obvious, it, right, where you're supposed to park. Well, it will make, this will be extremely obvious. This is taking a, just a pull off and drop off the highway into a formalized parking area. Cool. And it's, it's time. The beach is extremely popular. And, um, you know, the, the thing is the rangers, they see 21 cars, 22 cars at the most. For the most part, they feel 10 cars, 12 cars, 16 will be plenty for 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. It's just those really hot, you know, like Saturdays and Sundays that people just, um, you know, decide to come out, so. I just worry that it becomes an attractive, something that attracts people to the beach and it makes it even more busier, builds on its busyness by creating a pullout and an inviting place to park and hey, what are we, what's, what's what attraction are we coming to today, you know, rather than driving by it and maybe even missing it for those well, who don't know it's there people the drive is, by it and park people, on the highway and walk back the, the reality is is it's been found this is not something that's randomly um it's you not know, a secret it, not a secret this anymore. is not a, and we had this conversation because the open space board worries about that there's there's yeah, no, people that keep asking us you know can we make this not and i'm like the secret's out on north star i hate to say <laughs> that i mean there was over 5,000 people that use this area. And so the secret's out unless you want to shut the access off, which would be a bummer. This beach area is truly loved by the public. And, you know, we feel like if you can control the access here, you know, we've controlled people what they do on the beach. It's a lot better. We don't have the big party atmosphere anymore. But it's a really huge family piece for people. And it's it's the only place that you can kind of access the river and have a nice little spot, you know, that's outside the city of Aspen, so. Is, is there any way to put in the parking as you've suggested, but make sure that the actual visible trail to the beach becomes more of like a bat cave entrance, like a chicane? You won't see it. You won't um, know it's, you, you won't know see what it. You're, why you're parking there unless you know why. <laughs> right, well, because you'll parking, just see that like a good place to park. You, all you do is you have a trail down to, right now you have a trail down to the, Right. Uh, a trail it, down it to the seems kind of East wild Aspen and secret. Trail. It's just it's an it's an, enhances it if it's secret and wild rather. We're than... We're not changing the okay. uh, once you go from the East Aspen Trail to the beach. That's not changing. So I mean, that's you can still... see it from the road if people are sitting around on right. a picnic. Plant line, a couple yeah. trees. Yeah. Oh, you can. <laughs> oh, you can secret, totally see secret people. places. Kind of I have, have to... noticed people launching their paddleboards. I mean, I've yeah. paddled. We're we're actually ticketing for that. So if we do catch people doing it, we're we're stopping that because we just don't, that is not what this is meant for. And that's why we're going to go to the next one, which is Southgate. We really want, this one is, let's improve it so people do park here. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that this is visible for people to park here because this lot can handle it and it's a perfect access point to the river. And we just, you know, one of the biggest problems with this right here is Right now, you're on the East Aspen Trail. You go right into the middle of this parking lot, and right. people stop all the time, mm -hmm. like, where do I go? Right. What do I do? And so... On their bikes, you mean, on the yeah. trail? Because they go yeah. right into where that truck is. Mm -hmm. So because what we'll we're see, proposing, we'll and yeah. Jesse can so pop trail, it on. So the trail, like, right now, you come out, and you're in the parking lot, and you kind of have to look, and there's cars blocking you, but it connects back in on the other side of the parking lot. 
but it's very not obvious. So this plan will kind of move the trail to the other side of, um, or yeah, I think the other side of the yep. fence um, and allow for that parking space to be just parking, not trail. <laughs> and so it'll be a lot more transparent of where to go. And then, like we discussed That's in those other areas, the you formal. You can put the plan up. Um, so yeah, so if you see it here, yeah, the East Aspen Trail now go, will go behind it. We'll go so behind the parking area. And those, sure. those corners are easily, like the one on the far. This one has been revised. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, that, that one, we had to do, we have to do a little more tree removal, but we're making it. Um, so you can hit it on you're your gonna, It's going to be a total curve. Miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's been softened. This, yeah, was limited. We might lose preliminary. number 23. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we lost. No, we, I don't think you know, we didn't lose 23. We, we kind of, the way we push things around is, is to make, we still have 23 spots and, and you have a better curve for that end of the trail. Um, you know, what's nice out there. Cause I, I park out there to, to paddle board and I paddle down and then paddle right back up or paddle up and then paddle down. So I just leave the car and come back to it. Um, sometimes we leave the dog in the car and it, it sure would be nice to have shade. If there was a shade option and, and what, what, we do, what we do is we park up alongside you know a little bit farther down where this big tree on the south end kind of shades the road a bit yeah. I don't know if that'll ever be a possibility you know they're going to take you to jail if the dog is in the car and it's 110 well, degrees the windows in the car are down. it's so not we're going to put in right. patio shelters like we have at the airport so it's very unobtrusive and it looks like <laughs> natural park nature park parking lot and Greg will pay for it so our biggest problem here is most of these trees are, have, are, you know, they should be a lot bigger than they are, but they're not because they're all 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. It, it, they're just, and they're aspens and they just, mm -hmm. there's not, because it's getting warmer out there and we're seeing drying all over the place yeah. and we do not have any irrigation to, the big house across to do the street, that. So. Is there a ditch that went through there? Like, why are they even there? Uh, there were ditches at one time, and you know, it used to flood it was, all the way up there. And it used to it used to flood more, so we, we just don't get that anymore. And it's the high country in Colorado where it's supposed to be wet. It's supposed to be and definitely through there because there's a lot of wetlands through there. So well, it's the problem with North Star is is what we're seeing through our, all our wells is North Star is drying up, and it's okay. just there. Yeah. So that's it. Okay, so, good because we have definitely gone over our time limit on this one. Yes. So, but that's okay. Good conversation. Now is there another? The parking lot Wildwood is, is. What about Wildwood? Yeah. Well, Wildwood, we're working with the Forest Service right now on a potential land exchange with them uh -huh. because it's still Forest Service property. So I think let's see if, where we can go with the land exchange before we propose any improvements because otherwise we we'd have them? to go through NEPA we and have some in -holding. Yeah, no, we'd, right. we'd have to do a large process to do improvements there. So if in the next, we'll, we'll be giving you updates as we keep getting through but we're we're moving through a process with them so i i'm not there, there might be a way to get this done sooner than we then you know our typical 10-year ten ten year deals mm -hmm. um my only last comment on that lot is i see what you're doing it makes it makes sense just once again the aesthetic wilder than parkway with well it's not paved right. that one's not paved so we're so not there won't be one-way one. signs on the pave painted yeah. on the road or anything right so it's not it's not like you're going to see a big change because it's not like we're paving that lot. Got it. And the East Aspen's not a paved trail. So and there's a fence there now. And so you'll you it's it's really not going to change all that much except for once we regravel that area and regrade that area, you're going to see the 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 spots are better defined. Right. Is there an increased gain in number of spots there? It's pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, because right now it, it ends up being a little spot. haphazard, so it's not really parked effect or efficiently because people mm -hmm. can, it's not I marked. completely support moving the bike path the other side of the cars because yeah. that's the yeah. dicey thing. Yeah. We've been wanting to do that for years. We just oh, wanted yeah. to figure out the parking lot first. Yeah. That's a good idea. I like these ideas because they play into my thought about our access to the wilderness that we have around here that... I've heard it talked about at other meetings with Forest Service and that we should expand some of the parking lots at trailheads and stuff. And 
I feel like we should be definitive about how many cars can park here and when there's that many cars here, that's it, it's closed. And so I don't know how else we can ap approach the um, overpopulation of our trails and, and backcountry spaces without having some kind of limit. And it seems like car access is a lever that we have to do that. Like, or you permitting. want to go hike this trail, and you don't need a permit to hike it, but you get there in the park, like Hanging Lake used to be. Used to be you'd go, try to go hike Hanging Lake, and there were no parking places, so you didn't go. Right. So, okay, so okay. this will come back to us with our supplementals. Yes, it will, but we just and they will, give us uh, they a thumbs up. They will outline better we'll the moving. costs and the changes that we have yep. um, discussed today. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All Thank right. you. We are going to move to our next item, which is review of future agendas. Um, the only thing I think I'm going to put on the site visit for the 19th. Uh, we have a site visit, uh, turnabout, turnaround. Turnabout. Um, on the for the 19th. 19th, I thought it was. To one up the Prince Creek. So is the board, Steve, will be just coming back from Grizzly Bears country and Grand Baby country. Mm -hmm. So is the board good with the 19th? It's a Monday. Time um, what time are we looking at? We don't know yet. Um, I have to go from there to Breckenridge. So I need, I need to be on my way to Basalt by 2.30. By 2.30? Yeah. Okay, so, so that like should work out. Anytime, but I just yeah. so let's need an let's hour ask and Leslie and then we can figure out. Is Leslie Leslie was going to try and come on? Yeah, Leslie's here. I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, but I so she's right. I've got you I sound can't like see anybody else though. there now. What time is where oh, we go? So Leslie, can we do it in the morning? Say ten o'clock. Kelly needs to be back at Basalt by two thirty, and I need to I be need headed to be leaving to, to Basalt by two thirty. Oh, okay. So we could do a need what? I need to I need to leave there to go to Basalt. Yeah, by so, 2 so we right. could do ten thirty or eleven, right? And that would be fine. Leslie, ten thirty, eleven. You know. We could do later. We could do one o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, yeah, but I got to head back all the way over to Breck. So it's twenty minutes from Basalt. Okay, we're gonna ask for Leslie to do something around ten thirty and eleven. Leslie. 20 minutes from Carbondale, 20 minutes from Basalt. Prince Creek? Prince Creek is... Ah. Leslie, we're talking maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock, the morning of the 19th. Turnabout is nine minutes from downtown Carbondale. Got it. Okay, okay. Leslie. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, but can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you guys, and I can see you guys. Okay, we, I'm saying 10, 30, or 11 on the 19th. Does that work? I'm sure that will work. The team told me any time that day works okay. for them. I, you guys should plan at least oh, an hour for the site. You can just walk over. Yeah. So I will not be there. We know that. But Steve, yeah. Steve will not be there. Because I am arriving about that time is when I'm arriving at DI. Yeah, we've already got you out yeah. that day, and you already said you're familiar, or you can do it with Leslie or free yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So uh, that will be work. So it works on the 19th, Leslie. Okay, uh, you guys said 9.30 or 10? 10.30 or 11. Okay. Okay. I'll put together an agenda with directions and where we'll meet, and you will see that. We'll figure out the rest of the details, I promise. Okay, thanks, you guys, so much. Thanks. The only other thing, do we need to notice Bob Broaddus' memorial service if there's going to be more than three of us? When is it? It's Saturday the 27th. Well, if, if this it's Saturday. a social which thing, one? you don't. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because there will be probably which at least three. Hmm? 27th right. of which month? Uh, but this, we can always... This week. Uh, Steve's leaving on August. the 27th. Yeah. All right, any other future agendas that we need to talk about today or can we... Well, I have a bunch here from Charlotte and I'll go through them really quick. Um, okay. Redstone's meeting is scheduled for the 27th. Of four September. To six, uh, September. This is... There's a September. Um, she hasn't heard from the church, but she should okay. hear. Also, at that same time, there's the AM, AIMF conference, the 26th to what the 29th. What is that? That's the mountain one that I was asking yeah. about a couple weeks ago. Oh, that's the, the UN one. one. Right. Um, there's three passes available if people want to attend to let Charlotte know. So there's three passes. It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, that event. Um, City of Aspen has been asked to put in a 
vent together. Wait, 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 wait. Let's go back to this okay. AMF. Redstone. There was because no that same one, thing. we have, there's three passes, but we have meetings that week. So we still need a quorum here for at least mm -hmm. the work session. And do we have a regular meeting on that? We have a regular meeting on that Wednesday, and we have a work session and Redstone on that Tuesday. Right. So the board needs to keep that in mind if you're going to be attending this climate conference, because we need... Yeah, I guess we probably we attend on Monday and Thursday. Those are probably like many days. And Redstone is at, at 5 p.m.? Have you talked Four to, to six. about it, Craig? No, we're not going to... I haven't talked to anybody. Okay, we, so um, it's... Yeah, we, are, we will be done here that Tuesday by 2.30 to get in the car and drive right to Redstone. Correct. Redstone is at the same time, and Redstone's 4 to 6. Okay. Also, on the 27th, uh, City of Aspen is planning an event on government climate issues, but you all are in Redstone. Um, mm. So we will not be able to attend. Maybe they could reschedule. Um, Charlotte said she sent you a link um, to the schedule, but yeah, this is something that the city's trying to put together they've been asked to do that and they volunteered well so but we don't have anybody we could have a staff this conference is going on at the institute right and we could have a staff person represent the county if that works for the board i guess the board needs to i would like if the board would like to have everybody at the redstone meeting right and staff could attend the the piece that which is also on the 27th who asked them to do it I think the conference folks, they were trying to have some outside oh, the AI activities. People. Yeah. I don't say anything from Charlotte about that. Okay, so we'll figure that out. It's yeah. not until the 27th. Uh, okay. Lunch at Twin Lakes is trying to get rescheduled. The 21st isn't working. Um, oh, Twin Lakes, uh, Lake County decided they couldn't do it on the 21st. Oh, you're kidding. Well, right. It changes everything in terms of the 2030. Yeah, but we still need to have a quorum here for our regular meeting. I mean, our work so session. So Charlotte's trying to hear if Wednesday. No, we don't have a work session that day. On we don't have a work session Tuesday that the day. 20th. On the 20th? 20, oh, work session, my bad. Yeah. But the uh, lunch was on Wednesday, so that means we can go to the 2030 all day on Wednesday. Yes. And Charlotte's trying to see if October 5th will work. Um, Colorado Watershed Conference, October 11, 13. I'm not going. Is anybody else going? Healthy Rivers and Streams has three slots. They're waiting to hear. Lisa's waiting to hear if. What day? What, do we have regular meetings those days? I mean, I think it's great if we can attend these other conferences, but. The 11th is a Tuesday. We need to make sure we at least have a quorum here. The we don't have a Wednesday meeting that day on the 12th. So th these are in Avon. Can we go back to the September. 2030 meeting? Yeah, we're going it? really fast here. Mm -hmm. Kelly, we're close, both close planning on being in Breckenridge, and there is an after meeting that day. I don't know if I, um, I was only maybe going to go for Thursday evening talk that night on, on Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. But if Lake County is canceled, then I'm not sure I'll. Okay. Because I was going like to meet you in so. Twin Lakes and drive yeah. her over. But and so. So my plans are in flux. Um, All right. So we'll just communicate week. about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Core is having its twenty a twenty fifth anniversary event on the twentieth of September. Just so you all know, and that well, evening I'm planning on being here for that. That's a work session day. What time Waiting is there? Event? Long after five. the work session. It's at five at night. Yeah. Okay. I will be Go in Breckenridge. And I'm not, I'm torn. Yep. Still whether to be there or not. Even though I was chairman of CORE for seven years. There you mm -hmm. I talked to Dave Monk about it on Sunday night, and he said if I wanted to leave and go over to Breckenridge, it was fine. He didn't think it would, anybody would mind, especially if you are going to be there, Greg. Oh, yeah, I'm planning on being there. <clears throat> okay, one, okay, one more item. I'm tentatively planning on being there and leaving after to go to Breckenridge, and we should talk about the condo stuff okay. maybe after the meeting. Um, I've got my everything's upstairs. We got time. It's not till then. Yeah. Okay. And I need to take my own truck. But well, I'm, well, yeah. And In interviews for the airport advisory board. Um, Charlotte wanted to confirm you did not want to interview Barry Vaughn again. You interviewed him the first time, or he's one of the three applicants for this next opening. 
Uh, it's up to the board. Does didn't the board we want to re-interview him? Did we interview him for the actual original? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. 150 Sorry. people went. I think we should interview him. I think him. we should interview him again. We okay. want to interview all three. Got it. And when are we doing that? The applications close this Friday, so Charlotte has them scheduled on September 6th. Um, but she's awaiting to hear if someone can attend. So that's what's going on there. Okay. Anything else from Charlotte? That's all I have. That was a lot today. You said something about some, October, though. I, I have a big October one. October 5th, we may be scheduling the Twin Lakes lunch. Oh. So we have no September 14th regular meeting in our packet. Are we having a regular meeting on September 14th? It's on the calendar. It's, it's not on the... But because we, have it, we don't usually go that far in advance. The only reason we went to the 27th was because it was a day of a lot going on. But we, we, it skips September 14th. So we need to add September 14th. Yeah. It's the yeah. second and fourth. That's what I need to know. Is there a meeting that there, day? It's on the calendar. Because I'm going to be, well, it's not on. I know, but here. there is a meeting that day. It's okay. just not in future agendas packet. Okay. Because I will be. So we need to have in. that added to, to future agendas. Yeah. <laughs> it shows up here. Yep. I will take care of that. Or if you want to, Charlotte's probably listening. Okay, Steve, thanks for catching that. And that's all that's in the notes for me to go over with you. Okay. And I know that John and Rich are both on because I, I saw know. <laughs> And um, does the board have anything else? Because I know John Peacock's going to be very brief in his restructuring discussion that took me what three hours with you the other day <laughs> <laughs> so um you all of john you I, th I thought you left town it looks like you're still where you have always been <laughs> it's the beauty of technology patty i am uh joining you from dc who just rolled in this afternoon uh before i was able to hop on you so. survived did you bring any critters with you from the convention in denver uh, not from that, but a, uh, uh, a fish in a bowl did make it the uh, whole journey <laughs> across country with us. So. Is that you, the fish in the bowl, John, on the way? <laughs> it feels like it some days. Scott. All right. All right. You've got the floor, sir, to do a brief discussion about um, organizational updates restructuring discussion oh, great and I, I am hearing the word brief and getting out of there so we will we will do this quickly <laughs> you're, you're okay so you're okay I I do want to uh, give Phyllis a chance uh, first to make an announcement because this is part of why we're in front of you today so you don't Phyllis, get to make it no. Right? no no I'm getting uh, <laughs> not not good response over here and I hadn't said a word yet um, <laughs> so part of restructure uh, I've been trying to retire, and I'm really happy that this restructure plan includes a way for me to phase out of the county kind of slowly, um, which would start with a, a slight reduction in time beginning in January with uh, retiring in July of 23. So, and then going to a contract if there's projects that the county wants me to do, I would love to do. Things that we haven't gotten to do because things have been just so busy. Like Phillips. So, <laughs> like Phillips is in there. <laughs> contract for the rest of her life um, and ours. <laughs> and actually, with a, a survey just went out to some of our employees on retirement options and how do we do phased retirements to employees. So something near and dear to my heart and personally interest. Um, so with that would be the opening of my job of a deputy county manager soon, um, if it's approved by all of you to then be able to be recruited and have an overlap till the beginning of the year um, so that we can start working on a secession plan and, and real planning for me to leave. So are you saying that we should start looking for a replacement as of January 1 of 2023 or tomorrow? Earlier. <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, In-house or, or just out there? Um, so let me, that, let that's, me, uh, we'll pass it to John. Okay, John, please. Thank you. Let me jump in because we might want to, we might be able to answer some of these questions. Um, but as Phyllis said, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of time to, to plan a good celebration of, of Phyllis's service uh, to the county. Um, I won't be planning that, but I'll be asking folks uh, who are really good at planning those things uh, to do that. 
And as a board is aware, we've had some other um, pretty significant retirements uh, recently. Uh, Cindy Hubin is now a consultant uh, for us and is uh, um, also in a transition plan. Uh, we had Nan Sundin retire earlier. And so with these changes, um, we're taking a look and making sure that um, we're not missing an opportunity to maybe realign uh, the organization to be more effective given uh, all of the, the challenges that, that we've got in front of us. And so, um, Rich, if, if you'd go ahead and just pop this up, we're gonna go through just a few slides um, for, for the board. And so, as we were thinking about what are those opportunities and how might we uh, begin realigning responsibilities, um, the, the retirements were something that we we're looking at, which is a real driving force. A lot of, uh, um, you know, institutional knowledge uh, moving out of the door. The other thing that we are paying attention to is the significant number of capital projects. You all have already brought a few of them up. Um, Phillips, for example, will have us overseeing uh, water and sewer system uh, development that, that is something that has not been traditionally in our wheelhouse. Um, we have really significant projects coming up in the AABC area, particularly the uh, airport. Uh, we have the redevelopment of the Brush Creek Park and Ride, looking at uh, buttermilk. We, we have uh, the whatever uh, is going to happen uh, with our justice facilities going forward, whether that's a uh, project in place or looking at, you know, wherever the board ends up there, all of these have really significant um, project management and uh, infrastructure components to them. The other thing that we're seeing happening is an expansion of our planning and policy uh, needs. And so we have uh, our community development department, which uh, plays in more planning areas than, than traditional, whether it be uh, looking at climate action planning, um, our, our long range and growth management uh, planning connected to uh, climate change. Um, we have recently brought in a resiliency person to uh, manager to really do planning around uh, workforce uh, resiliency, a lot of focus on affordable housing and child care and, and uh, other aspects that we identified. But we didn't really have a central place where all of those planning functions were brought together comprehensively so that uh, we're looking at our strategic plan, resiliency planning, climate action planning, and land use planning under a single umbrella. They kind of got divided up in different areas uh, in, in the county. And so, um, of course, you probably can't see my cursor because I'm not projecting the, uh, the presentation, but um, what we are looking at is what makes sense as uh, an, end, an end state in terms of restructuring. And so big picture, um, what we're looking at is uh, retaining two deputy county managers, but um, focusing the, count, the deputy county manager functions into infrastructure and project management, um, and then planning, consolidating those planning functions. That means that uh, functions that are currently reporting um, under uh, either deputy managers or the assistant to uh, the county manager that aren't in those two areas are going to need to find uh, new homes. And so um, we have a final structure where under the county manager, we'd have the two deputies, one for infrastructure, and one for planning. We're going to go into a little bit more depth on the infrastructure one here in a second the human resources director, a chief financial and administrative officer, which will um, be coordinating kind of the op internal operations uh, of the county. So all the internal service departments, information technology, facilities, um, finance, 
uh, will be coordinated uh, out of this function, make sure that we've got a common culture uh, and that we have some, uh, you know, we're, we're not mm -hmm. overlapping with, with each other. Uh, we have the human services and public health directors, which currently report to Phyllis, would be coming back to me uh, mid-year, next year. Um, that's with the promise of no pandemics or major <laughs> financial crises, uh, hopefully, to manage. Um, and then our, our records manager and, and clerk to the board. We anticipate going back to having a management analyst versus an assistant too. The management analyst would not have any direct reports, but would be focusing on internal and external uh, policy work. And so uh, this is a function that uh, Kara in her original position uh, used to provide uh, primarily for the board. And it, it's something that we've lost a little bit um, as Kara's taken on more internal, you know, more reporting responsibilities. So trying to get back to um, being able to have some of that legislative work done on behalf of the board uh, and a resource there, but also looking at our internal policies and procedures and making sure those are up to date. Um, Phyllis, um, while we haven't agreed on the exact contract hours yet this far in advance, um, has, has agreed to stay on, um, at, at least in theory right now, from July until December, uh, a, again, on reduced hours, but to help uh, really prioritize the internal policy and procedure work and help get the uh, management analyst and um, our, our record, you know, help keep all of that uh, on track. Um, Phyllis, when she becomes a contractor, wouldn't have any direct reports, but would be acting in, in an advisory role. She keeps, I, I think, wanting the title of senior advisor, if I'm correct, Phyllis, but we're, we're working through that. Um, so this is the end game. Um, there's going to be a lot of transition steps uh, to get uh, from where we are today uh, to there. The, the most significant ones that would start this year um, are in the infrastructure uh, section and, and Rich would be the deputy county manager uh, overseeing that. And so I'm going to ask Rich just to walk through some of the changes that we've already made and, and some asks that we anticipate for the board. Great, <clears throat> thank you, John. Um, so as far as the infrastructure uh, side of this, there's been a couple of things that have already taken place. We had meetings quite a while back with the team and found that really uh, Gary in his role kind of set outside of what really was the infrastructure team. So. Uh, what we've recently done, and it was just a reporting change, didn't have any any fiscal impact. Uh, so it was just uh, organizationally. We brought Gary in underneath our umbrella with the infrastructure team. And then Dave Pesnicek has now moved under Public Works. And uh, we did move him there after it was established. John immediately didn't want Dave starting there. He wanted to be able to work with the elected officials, get his uh, kind of his sea legs under him coming in and establishing himself. But whenever he came over under my department, I noticed that every meeting I was at, so was uh, Brian Pettit. So there was a lot of synergies there with the two. So uh, we really felt we were missing a link with Gary and trying to keep down the direct report amounts. It just seemed to make sense to move Dave under public works. Uh, so we have agreed to, to make that move. The other thing that uh, you'll see whenever Connie talks to you, um, Brian Pettit is gonna do a reclass um, position with his fleet director and hire a public uh, works deputy director. And it does have a small financial impact and you'll see some of that coming forward. But this this position opens up opportunities for us to be able to talk about what we do in the future as far as facilities go. John talked to you about these green boxes. We've got employee housing, which is certainly a board interest, uh, high priority. We have all our housing leases. We've really gotten uh, involved in the housing side of things but we're still kind of missing the ost and the airport side of it um so we'll be dealing with that this this uh we've got a position here that we're looking at a reclassification that would come in and focus on this so they would work with uh the planning side that john was talking about about community housing but their focus would be on employee housing 
And they would also continue to do contract oversights on our existing building renovations. Uh, one thing that we've never had, Pickens County hasn't had really had an asset management program either. So we want to really jump into that a lot deeper. So this position would be a reclass uh, to be able to focus on those two items. What we're asking today uh, is the approval to move forward um, is to hire a new position mid-year. And this is the engineering and construction director position. And this really is set up uh, to offer success to all these programs. Again, these are the, the programs they would be dealing with uh, in this green box. Currently, I'm, I'm the direct report for our owner rep and they work hand in hand with me on uh, the owner's reps for the public works master plan and the microgrid. This person would start overseeing more specifically Phillips uh, and then RFP services that are gonna fall underneath that. Uh, Phyllis was really heavily involved in the, in the Phillips, as you guys know from the onset. So with her phasing out, we're needing to fill that void. So we're looking for this position to do that. And then one position that we, this current, this community development uh, engineer is currently contracted for. We use SGM to do that work for us. Uh, we're talking about that uh, to try to be able to bring this ComDev director underneath this engineering position internally and then fill that. And then that person, instead of contracting that out, would be able to uh, assist this engineer if there's some void or some downtime. We just aren't seeing downtime though, but. And and Rich, I just want to be clear, it's the ComDev engineer, not the ComDev director. I, I think you had a ComDev director. I yes, ComDev. <laughs> Com Dev engineer. Engineer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. So it's and that is an existing FTE that we have Correct. not been able to fill. Correct. So that's a restructure on the uh, on the infrastructure side of things, and I can move to the next uh, next slide that shows time frames, unless there's questions there. I'm not seeing any. Quick oh, question. Greg? Quick question. Just looking at like the the previous slide. I, 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 when I look over look at the finance and I look at the multiple jobs that, um, let's see, CFO, treasurer, public trustee, I always think, I always think, well, God, there's only got to be one individual who can do that, and that's Driggers, right? Um, are, I just want to make sure that we're not tuning all these positions for specific personalities that, you know, at some point will leave us and we have to restructure when they do. Like, are, are these positions, uh, you know, when there's a succession, um, how are we going to be set up for a succession? Yeah, and, and we've done some research, Greg. So these are not unique positions uh, to, to Picking County. And so um, there, there are chief financial and administrative officer uh, types of positions with that same kind of skill set and span of control. Uh, in other counties and in other nonprofit yeah, organizations. Yeah, but, but can they skate and stay up all night taking pictures of the stars? <laughs> Absolutely not. And, and and this is what we find. And and I'll I'll just share you, with you my philosophy. There tends to be, you know, one school of thought that says, "Hey, you build the organization as if the people, you know, don't, you know, you know, so you're not dependent on the people." And another school of thought that says, no, you build around the unique skill sets that you're, and, and my philosophy is it depends. Uh, you do a little bit of, of both. And so, um, you know, in, in this case, we are looking at some of the unique skill sets that, that we already have in the organization, but also trying to blend that so that, um, like you said, if we find ourselves needing to have a change in personnel in the future, um, maybe it's an incremental step and not a wholesale uh, change. Great, and, I, and I, I appreciate that, and I really do appreciate that yeah. when, when people do leave, they give us a long enough timeline, like Phyllis and Cindy have mm -hmm. done, where we still retain them as contractors. I, I think that makes sense. So I, I don't have to miss you yet. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, we're super lucky that way. What is that? How can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> <laughs> That's every time I see who, but I'm like, you're back. Yeah, we see her more now than we used to. <laughs> <laughs> but she's a lot happier, let me tell you. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, we can just run through the time frame real quickly for you here. So uh, in July, uh, we did make that switch with the EOTC and Public Works and uh, OST to the infrastructure. 
Uh, we have uh, talked to the E-team on the 17th. We presented a uh, concept to them. Uh, we always have them come present restructures to administration, this administrative restructure. So we did that. So um, she had mentioned that she is uh, planning on her retirement and she did that again today, which is in the BOCC uh, presentation. Uh, tomorrow, as John mentioned, uh, upon your approval uh, of this, we would uh, begin an internal recruitment for, uh, period here. So. We're looking at the deputy county manager, the public works deputy director, engineering construction director, and asset employee housing director. And again, some of those, um, well, in fact, all of them but one are all uh, internal backfill type positions. So they don't, don't constitute a new position itself. So uh, we'll begin to interview and fill positions on the 5th. Uh, there will be a supplemental coming to the BOCC that uh, will deal with the financial impacts on this, which I got to tell you aren't aren't a lot this year, but ongoing. You know, we we always look at those during the budget process. Um, in ta in October, um, we'll begin the internal recruitment for the CFAO position itself. In January, as we mentioned, uh, Phyllis reduces herself to 32 hours. And then in July, she then goes to contract. And that's whenever public health, human service uh, move over along with our records management and clerk to the board. And then in January, Phyllis may retire, but she may not, who knows, like you said, she may stay on contract. So, uh, but that at least gives you the, the timelines that we're looking at moving forward. So with that is that uh, this is, as John mentioned, was kind of the end game here. Okay. So we wanted to make the board uh, aware of kind of some of these uh, changes. Uh, the uh, uh, ask on the uh, budgetary side would come in the third quarter uh, budget supplementals, um, but didn't want that to come to the board out of context. Okay. Steve has a question. So you had listing the chief the CFAO opening that up, but Ann Driggers is that position now, or she is the treasurer public trustee. Are you anticipating that Ann will be the one to get that, or are you opening up to all comers to compete for that position? Yeah, so that, that would be an internal posting. I think we would have a, a limited posting, Steve. Under state law, we do need to uh, post these positions when they substantially change. Okay. And at least pro provide an opportunity for other candidates uh, to, to put their hat in the ring. Okay. All right, next. You can't be That's done already, Mr. That was it. That's it. Um, we, we went through it quickly. And so, um, you know, the, the planning no, side, yeah, you know, I would just note that, um, you know, that would include the planning deputy position, just as I sure. said before, would uh, consolidate functions for comprehensive planning uh, to include uh, community development, um, where the long range sure. planning would uh, report directly to the deputy county manager, climate action planning, uh, resiliency planning, uh, and strategic planning. And we would uh, likely keep our community engagement uh, under that deputy director because all of those functions as we're seeing with growth management right now uh, require a great deal of community engagement. And that would be matrix to me. So that's it. Uh, we we heard your direction to go a little quicker, Patty. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that worked out. I know, but I have seventeen more slides. Yeah, we do have seventeen more slides. All right. See you tomorrow, boys. Um, <laughs> right. Does the board have questions? Because this is there's a lot of more information that'll be coming forward to us all as we move in this direction. So this is, I think, the beginning of a restructuring, and we'll just kind of have to see how things pan out as who decides to fill positions and how we decide we want to fund them if we need to. Does the yeah. board have any and specifics or questions? Not seeing any right now, John, go ahead. Okay. 
Yeah, and you know, Patty, thanks. That the you know, there there will will be continuing to evaluate needs as we look at the 2023 budget, particularly on the project side. Um, uh, you know, if we have the the airport and we do have a justice project with all the others, Phillips and and whatnot. Um, we'll be evaluating, uh, for example, needs for procurement and admin support uh, in, in those project management functions. But that would be a 2023 budget discussion uh, versus this year. Okay. Um, I do have one thing to say, John. Um, we're going to let you go from this meeting now because you're in D.C. and I know you've got a lot of things that you and Chamberlain want to do while you're there. So we're glad you got there safely, and we hope to see you come safely home. I think your plan is to fly home on Friday. Yeah, I'm going to end up in the Springs for a little bit on the weekend, okay. so I'll be hopefully back in the Valley on Sunday. All right, on all right. Sunday. just keep us yeah. posted and enjoy your time with Chamberlain. Um, does the board have anything right. else before we sign off with John and Rich? Nope. Or do we, we have any for board open discussion or for them? John, do you want to stand for open discussion just in case? I I can stay on for okay. a few more, yeah. All right, so open discussion from the board. I have one. You have one? I have one open discussion item. Wow, okay. I know, go figure. Um, what we learned uh, that uh, the governor created Francis Xavier Cabrini Day, which is the first Monday in uh, October. <laughs> Right. And our home rule charter says that the county will observe all holidays that are set by statute. So just alerting you that we will be working toward communicating to our employees that we let we talked about this last week that it was did I miss it? Yes, that we were, <laughs> it's on a different Monday than Columbus Indigenous Peoples Day. Correct. So so staff needs to know that their three day weekend is not the weekend they think it is. It's the weekend before. Right. It is. Yes. Okay. And this has been in the making for a while. And we've asked Ely to review it just to make sure, and it didn't start until this year. So right. that's one. So we're good. what? It, what is the name of it again? Um, oh, I just closed it out. Um, Francis, Francis Cabrini. Xavier Cabrini. Francis Cabrini, the Cabrini Hobby. Shrine by Denver. Yeah. Yeah, she started okay. uh, orphanages, and from what I understand, it's the first woman who has a holiday named after her. So. Big recognition here. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Well, that was a landmark to me when I was a little kid because when we yeah. saw the Mother Cabrini shrine up on the hill, we knew we were almost back to Denver, <laughs> coming out of the mountains. My mother went to a boarding school named after her in huh. 19. Oh, really? 17. Yeah, in New York, she was oh, an Italian immigrant, so cool. she was a big Italian immigrant, and she's the patron saint of immigrants if you're a Catholic. Wow. Hmm. Well, that's okay. interesting. Well, that's why he did it then, probably, because of immigration. Mm -hmm. Would you like, do you have some open discussion? Yeah, I was going to talk. John had asked that I wait until everybody was here to talk about the thing with uh, Jared Polis this morning. Okay. Can I just do mine real quick? Yeah, of course. Um, I just wanted the board to know, and I brought it up a little bit earlier, we had a contact from someone who wanted us to look at where they could have a w waste dumping site for RVs. Um, I did... She suggested some spots that we've talked about in the past. So I very happily sent it on to Brian Pettit so the board knows that I've asked Brian to, I did respond to her, but asked Brian to follow up and respond to her more if he felt need be, just so the board knows that that's been taken care of. Okay, Francie's gonna fill us in on her okay, walk so, with the gov. Yeah, so I got a email and a text from Andres Carrera, who's uh, the deputy something in charge of communications for Jared Polis, who's asked, you know, the, the governor would be honored if you would join, blah, 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 blah. And it was originally just going to be somebody from Wilderness Workshop, which didn't happen, um, John Armstrong and myself, and then they added in Perry Will, and then John brought Susie and um, somebody else from um, Sabepa, and um, there were a bunch of security people there. And then there was a guy who showed up because he wanted to talk to Perry Will. <laughs> so he followed us around. It was, it was in the, was paper in the picture. Like it was a public I know. Event. That's what he said. That's how he knew about it. Um, but pro the, one of the reasons he came and met with John is because he's honoring Sabepa's 50th anniversary, which was really great. And um, he was 
very warm and open and he listened really carefully to what everybody said and he had questions that showed that way more interest in this than I had anticipated. So it was great and it was about a half an hour and we <clears throat> walked across the bridge, looked down at the river, talked about how it was colored. So John described that that's because it's coming from rain in marble. Had it been rain from redstone, it would have been redder. I mean, the, what he knows about the river is just awesome. Well, but anyway, it was right, slate right. colored, mm -hmm. you know, and we, and we talked about how, um, I talked with him about how it's unusual for, for you to see this much river in the water compared to the last few years, water, water in the river <laughs> compared to the last few years, but it's because we just had this huge rainstorm. It's usually quite a bit lower than this this, this time of year, or at least recently. And, um, and then we went down to the river and um, and he alternated between whom he was speaking with. He spoke mostly with John and and me, and he talked with Ben. Ben Bobhuck was there from Carbondale, um, mostly with the three of us. And um, it, I thought it was good. You know, John did say what I had asked him not to say, which was, well, if we find that um, wild and scenic is the best route to preserve the river, then you know we'll support it. Kind of thing. Which is not what their website says, mm -hmm. but and I had asked him to just say, "Yeah, we're really about the love scenic," but he said that. But you know, I don't know how much of that will stick with the governor, and so I'm going to follow up with his um, communications person about the status of wild and scenic right now. I did talk to him about it the other day, but I thought we should follow it up with something in writing about you know, who's on the stakeholders group and stuff. And I also, Kelly mentioned to Ben that he'd probably be hearing from the stakeholders about having representation from Carbondale. Mm -hmm. And he's going to introduce it to Carbondale, the draft resolution, um, the 14th. And we have a meeting on the 14th. So they meet on the 14th and we meet on the 14th. So I was going to do it, but we could just have somebody else do it. You know, it could be Chuck or Chuck or somebody could do it. Um, just to be there to answer questions for the board. Uh, I don't think it should be Bill, but we can talk about maybe that. Maybe Lisa or Lisa. Yeah, maybe Lisa or Lisa mm -hmm. would be good. That's a good idea. Um, anyway, I thought it was a great meeting, and um, he was seemed pretty open to the whole thing, and so I was encouraged by it. It was much better than I thought it was going to be. Did he talk about any of like the broader water issues? Um, he didn't direct the conversation very much. He had some questions. We did talk about it when he did knelt down to feel the water. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that one of the issues that we're having in the West right now is that when the water levels drop, the, the rivers warm up and it's really dangerous for the fish and they can't sustain themselves when the water gets warm. He said the water felt pretty warm to him. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure it's a lot colder today than it was two days ago before the rains, mm -hmm. you know. But um, we talked about that. We talked a little bit about the augmentation that I had talked about how the call um, for augmentation had sort of threatened some subdivisions and how that was a real wake up call that hey, we really do have a serious issue in the Crystal River Valley and um, and John uh, supplemented that conversation and um, it was really great to have John there because he does has such a depth of knowledge. Sure. And, yeah. um, so it was good. It's so where did you where did you go on the Crystal? Oh, we met at the Crystal River Bridge at, at the, the at south end entrance at RER where they have okay. the riverfront park that I think we helped fund, right? Pickens County helped fund that? No? Mm -hmm. I thought open we space. did. Open space. It's the no, whole... Not the yeah, one at River space. Valley Ranch. Open, I think open space did. Yeah. There was okay. open space. Hmm. It, yeah. No, it's the whole... It goes all the way to the um, hatchery. Mm -hmm. for, it just happens to start in RBR. It goes to the hatchery, goes past that nooch, nooch, nooch park, which is right at the bottom of Prince Creek Road. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really a trail because they're trying to be really unintrusive in the natural riparian zone there. So we were kind of, you know, going my through bushes. Lived, and my kids stuff. lived right there at the Doherty Farm. So uh -huh. It's right there. Yeah, it's right there. So uh, so that's where we went. And we didn't walk very far. I mean, we didn't so have So you were in Tom Turnbull's bullpen yes, pasture. We, yes. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay. Yep. Former, formerly known as. Yeah, <laughs> Retire worked. That was Retire. Oh, I'm first glad you got to do that. that job. Yeah, it was really good. And then um, I met with Cole uh, Berger, 
yesterday, and uh, he's going to set me up with Adam Frisch, just so you guys all know, to talk about wolves, so that when he goes to the rural communities, he knows about the wolf Perfect. thing. So. Okay, any other open discussion? Kelly, please. Yeah, I handed out some folders um, that were given to me to distribute to you all related to the Financial Empowerment Center, which um, we have supported standing up, and I went on our behalf on Monday and met with um, Commissioner from Eagle County, uh, Matt Scher, and then Tom Jankowski, and Lindsay Mache, and Sam Lander Casper, and Sharon, whose last name I forget, who is the Human Services Director in Garfield County, and then Eagle County had their Human Services people online. And we heard a presentation from the um, Cities for Financial Empowerment who have experience setting up these programs in mostly cities around the country and the success that they um, have had. And this is um, really helping people learn how to um, do a variety of things for to empower themselves at the household level financially. So if they're unbanked, you know, the helpfulness of getting banked, how to get and improve credit scores, um, create savings, pay off debt, um, things like that. And I, it was great. I learned I learned a lot. Um, you know, Sam has, Nan Sundin really kind of inspired this and handed it off to Sam to continue on. Um, as a regional project. This is the first regional center um, that this organization, which is a very niche organization, is helping to support. They have contributed $100,000 through grant their grant funding to this effort to organize it and help stand it up. Um, the hope is that there will be an RFP for a, a nonprofit provider who will essentially hire financial counselors that will then provide the counseling services to anyone who comes in off the street in our region unless unless we define some further restriction to that. Um, and that the funding for it can really come from any type of state or federal program that's directed towards anti-poverty. Um, so it could be like our TANF funding or our emergency service grant fundings and block grant funding and a lot of other things um, to help with long-term maintenance of the program. Long-term long -term maintenance long -term. of the program. Sustainability, I should say, of the program. Um, and that they also, one of the benefits of, of relying on um, the Cities for Financial Empowerment to help with this is that they have very sophisticated data tracking and ability to link people with other wraparound services. So the hope is that folks who are coming into, you know, any of the nonprofits that provide human services or any of our human services programs can also be linked and that information um, can be shared across them so that we can track essentially is, is the financial empowerment skills that people are learning helping them to um, either better utilize or to move off altogether um, human services um, that we offer. And so, is this completely separate from the work that Barbara does with helping people set up savings accounts? So it is it is separate. Um, La Medici is its own um, oh, yeah, kind of non, right. La Medici is um, its own nonprofit it's and has its own kind of app. She would be the profile of a nonprofit that might um, apply to the RFP and act as the counseling provider. Um, so that's yet to be determined because that, that our, we're not at that point of that RFP okay. sort of yet. But that, in a nutshell, is what the program endeavors to do. And how is she joining with Lama Teaching? I don't know. We didn't chat much. It was just quick and then she left. She showed me how the so, app works. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good anyway, good day. Thanks so, for the information. Mm -hmm. Steve. One more item. Um, you all will be receiving a copy of a letter that I received today from Wayne Roush and Wayne Anger, who have been living on the backside of Aspen Mountain. And I've been talking to them for quite some time about their residency back, back there. They have a proposal. They are living on county, on a county mining claim. And so I've been communicating with John Ely all along with the information they've been giving me and I urged them to make a proposal and submit it to the county 
so then we could all consider it together. And so they finally did submit a proposal that we will be looking at in an executive session at, at some point in time. So when you get the letter, which I didn't get it to Charlotte today, it, it'll be, you know, sometime tomorrow you, you'll be getting the letter. So Just know the Charlotte. background, where it came yeah, from. And it's, it's I urged, executive session material. So. Yeah, and I urged them to submit something to us so we'd have something to consider. So okay. finally they have done that. Thanks, okay. yeah. And I have one more thing yeah, I forgot please. to tell you guys. I went to see Mac Keeling at Aspen Ski Co. yesterday um, because of because John Doyle had talked to me about and and I've heard from others about the uh, cutting of trees and the using uh, I and, to, and work, work construction. What are you talking Pandora's? Yeah, up on Pandora, up right next to Pandora. So I and also I got a call from Molly. Um, forgot her last name on the backside of Bassford Mountain, who said that a truck had come down um, that side, it was really loud, it had his jake brakes on, and she'd gone out to talk to him, and he had said something and, and drove away with his jake brakes on. And So anyway, I went to see Mac, and... Hi, you're gonna talk Pandora, so I have to... Oh, well, it's just about... Yeah, okay. But, okay. You, I'll, I'll be right here. Okay, so just let it finish. Um, I had actually communicated with John earlier about and told him about what John had said and he had gone and and I had asked him then if I could talk to Auden and Mac and he had said no not now because if we have to do any enforcement you know you can't be in the middle of that or whatever so he had gotten in touch with Suzanne who had said that apparently what they had done was done cutting and road work on the existing ski area so like near Walsh's not on the newly acquired permit area. So anyway, so I went to see Mac, just talk it through with him, even though it looked like it was fine, you know, and to talk through the complaint from the backside of the mountain, and Mac was wonderful as he always is. But he showed me the map and showed me the area where they had been, and then it also showed where the calving grounds are. And so the newly acquired permits are uh, south, and then and sort of right next to where they had done the cutting on the existing ski area land, and the calving ground sort of wrapped around like this. So to the east, to the below it, I don't, to the to the southeast, right, to the below, southmost. Yeah, yeah. Below, down and below it. I, I made him turn the map so it was north, south, east, and west because I don't, I can't just look at the ski area and know mm -hmm. which is which. I have to see it on a map. So it looked to me, and I said this to Mac says, look to me like where you did the logging and the road work is exactly the same distance from the calving grounds as where we asked you not to be uh, until June 22nd. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, that's true, but we put in a CMP with Tom Depp, plan. Uh -huh. and, and went through the Forest Service and the, and the CMP was granted by ComDev and Forest Service came out twice in May. Well, they came out the end of April, and then they came out again in May just to check everything out and to talk about the depth of the soil and where they could have heavy equipment and where they couldn't. And, and he felt like the Forest Service was very on top of assessing the work that they were doing and had okayed it. And you know, they also got a, uh, an okay from CPW, although they don't really have um, the authority to give the go-ahead, they just are advisory, but, um, so he said he went through the CMP, he put it out in the paper, it was public, he heard from Marcella and one other person, I forget who the other person was, and he said, I did everything I could do to be transparent, you know how Mac is, he's totally charming, and, um, and uh, got all the right permits and so on. So then I said, well, what about the truck on the back side? All the trucking was supposed to be on the summer road in the front, and so on the front side, they widened three um, hairpin turns because the logging trucks for the tr trees they're cutting down are 35 feet long, are, are 35 feet long, but the logs themselves are 35 feet. So by the time they stick out the back, the trucks are 42 feet. They couldn't make those three turns. So they widened those turns, but coming down with a loaded truck, they still couldn't make those turns. So they had to use the backside, and he sent notices out to everybody back there and communicated with everybody, blah, blah, blah. And they have to use their jake brakes to go down and go around those corners back there. So 
That was his answer to that. It looked like he went through as many channels as he could figure out how to go through. And so uh, that was the extent of my conversation. I didn't talk to you guys about it ahead of time, so I wanted to find out if it was illegal or what. But it looks like it was legal. I told Mac it looked like it was kind of not within the spirit of our agreement. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but um, I think we could probably expect the same thing next year. But the the lift, I, I found out something really interesting that's going to happen. I thought the couch chair was coming out, but what actually is happening is they're working on the terminus of the new chair, and then next year that'll go in, and then in twenty four or maybe the winter of 23, it will be operating, but so will the couch. And they're gonna keep them operating at the same time and assess the amount of traffic and see if the new chair, if it's right, if they should take out the couch. Or depending on the amount of traffic over there, whether they should actually leave the couch in there. And I thought that the couch was gone this summer. I was really surprised to hear no, that. No, no, they were, I remember distinctly, they were gonna leave it in and see whether they maybe would still need to use it or maybe because not. Because of traffic. They, they yeah. didn't really know. Right, that. so he explained that it's to me. It's so slow, it's hard to imagine, you know, I, I find it so, I'd never ride it. Cause it's I like slow so, lifts, because you, if you can like hang to out go and slow, talk to your right. friend. And, yeah, well, just, he also talked about the trees that they had uh, masticated. All the down trees and stuff, they didn't haul them out, you know, they masticated them. And the Forest Service had been very explicit that they couldn't have any, um, residue from the mastication of the trees deeper than three inches. And so when they came up to check on that, the Forest Service, the treads and stuff of all the equipment had sort of mixed the top layer of the forest floor with the chips, which are pretty big. He said they're like this big, and some of them are thick. But the Forest Service was really happy with the fact that they had sort of co-mingled them and it was like a thick Into mulch the dirt and it. light enough for the plants to come up through. So huh. that's pretty much what I learned from Mac yesterday. Oh, interesting. I was under the impression that when they were going to be hauling logs off, they were actually going to use the back road, or there would be times when they had to. Well, there are the times original presentations, to. that They've was part of the done it three original. times, and then today was probably going to be the fourth time, and there might be a few more trips, but they'll be done the first week of October, right. and he's still in communication with the owners back there. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate what you say about the spirit of, you know, the, the timing, because when we amended the management plan the management plan is not specific to pandora so you know i'm i'm troubled honestly interesting so the management plan for not being up there before may 26th june 22nd you thought was for the whole area right because that's we rezoned to include that in a management plan and mm -hmm. the whole plan covers the rezoned and the previously zoned area mm -hmm. so I definitely don't think it was in the spirit of our no I don't think it was in the spirit either um, but you know I don't know if I can take it any further than I've taken it I've been through John Ely and well, can we anticipate it happening again next spring and do we have authority to change the management plan without it being applicant uh, motivated would be a question I will ask John Ely they do have a master plan new master plan for snow mass coming out and they're anticipating a new lift. Oh no, the new the couch they're thinking is probably going to go to Buttermilk, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> I can't imagine where, but um, <laughs> but in it was kind of funny because he said, "Well, in '94 it was part of our plan to have another lift at such and such, and so we're going to keep it there. And then if we decide to do it, we will." So it's like they're not going to let go of anything that's been decided in the past. But anyway, so there's a new master plan coming up for snow mass, I think it's next year, and then buttermilk will be right after that. And I don't know whether Bill Natson is just gonna handle that whole snow mass thing without us, or which I guess could happen. Mm -hmm. um, and Mac didn't know either. So. Is it snow mass village or is it Pitkin County? I Come thought on. they annexed all okay, the ski Okay, let's stop talking there, about, yeah. we'll let Patty back in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there any more items? Patty, I do have uh, one other piece of uh, um, bad news for us, uh, but, but good news for uh, Dave. Uh, Dave Pesnicek, uh 
has accepted a position um, with the Grand Canyon uh, Park as their transportation coordinator. Oh, wow. so, oh, have wow. fun for him. He is, uh, yeah, he is planning on, on moving on around uh, October 14th, no, which lets uh, the other managers today. know. Oh. I know. God, that's Does he know fast. it's really hot there and there's lots of tarantulas? <laughs> <laughs> well, all the best to him. And more tourists than here. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're excited for him. I think it's an exciting opportunity. I, I think maybe some of the other uh, councils may be hearing about that this week, so just wanted to give you a heads up. He's going to be um, hard one to replace, history. hard one to replace. That's Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. Okay, John, would reason. you like to end us on a happy note? Like, uh, you got us how many millions of dollars while you were there in Washington for... I'm working on it, Patty. Okay. Yeah, yeah tell <laughs> Chamberlain. Mail, take, Ch take Chamberlain to, out to a nice dinner. Yep, I'm going to do that. Thank All right. you. All right. Enjoy your okay. time. Bye, John. Bye, John. Bye. Bye. From the board. Bye. Okay, Bye. tomorrow at noon time, um, I'm going to be reaching out to uh, Julie McCluskey to see if she's got some time tomorrow. She wanted to stop by and, I guess, chat with the board. I'm gonna, I have not had a chance to reach her. I'm going to work on that right now. Thank you. Are, are we done? We are done. Thank you, Grassroots. Thank you, you ma'am. See everybody tomorrow. Hey. All right, I'm going to see.